Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the afternoon session of the Winchester City Council Planning Committee. I'm Therese Evans. I'm the chair of the committee. I'm sitting normally here, but sitting over there is Julie Pinnock, the service lead for the built environment. And then we have Fiona Sutherland, who's the legal advice today, and um, Matthew Watson, who's the clerk for the meeting. Um, and then all councillors have their names in front of them. So we move on then to agenda item 11, which is the um, erection of 24 residential units. Uh, class C3, six three-bed houses, two three-bed flats, 14 two-bed flats and two one-bed flats and a replacement use pool following the demolition of all existing buildings. And the case number is 21-00359-FUL. The case officer is Liz Marsden, who is sitting ready to give her presentation. So when you're ready, Liz. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, as you hear, the proposal is for the redevelopment of uh, Corner Site in Bishop's Waltham with residential and a replacement youth hall. Uh, the site is located on a fairly prominent corner. It's within the conservation area and near the centre of Bishop's Waltham. Um, it's on the other side of the road to the Bishop's Waltham Palace, which is to the south of the site. And there is a supermarket to the west and residential to the north. Oops, sorry, I'm over. So that's an aerial photo showing the site, which together with the structures that are currently located on it, the large shed along the eastern boundary was um, Fox's Garden Machinery Building, and they did repairs of lawnmowers and things. The central building, I believe, was formerly an NHS building, but that was vacated some time ago and now operates offices. And then there is a youth hall located on the western side of it, which is still functioning. The proposal is a fairly it's a comprehensive redevelopment of the site, um, which incorporates uh, houses and flats, the houses along the Winchester Road frontage and flats and it, the youth hall in the block along the Malt Road frontage. There's also a not separate northern block, which is um, which is flats and um, two storey underneath um, as a response to criticism, previous criticisms about uh, the excessive parking and hard standing. They have incorporated some undercroft parking beneath the northern block. Uh, this application follows the refusal of a previous application on the site, uh, which was a more intensive use of the site with a greater level of residential and also incorporated some retail units along the Winchester Road frontage. Uh, as you, this is just for comparison, as you can see there, nearly all of the surface area not taken up with building was used for car parking. Proposed first floor plans, these are just showing what the, how the size of the units um, in their location and relative to each other. And proposed second floor plans, the Malt Lane block, it's got more of accommodation in the roof space there aren't any second floor plans for the northern block and the southern properties along Winchester Road have an element which could be another bedroom though I think they're labelled as office and those are the roof slopes. So in terms of elevations the Malt Lane elevation has potentially the tallest building in the out of all of the properties there, um, but they have scaled it down. The applicants have 
been talking to the parish council and various other local bodies and have produced um, a variety of elevational treatments within the same format of building. So some of these are these are set forward as potential alternatives and they incorporate, for example, this is the parish preference for the Malt Lane frontage, so it has element of render to it as opposed to all brickwork. And those are the previously refused Malt Lane elevation, so um, not to confuse you, these aren't what's currently in front of us. And similarly, for the proposed elevations along Winchester Road, this is the, the street edge and the northern elevation of those show triangular bays, which are proposed to be green walls. And again, this is tile hanging and brick, um, but the parish preference again for that is, is broken up a bit more with elements of render, tile hanging, incorporated into it. And these are other potential alternatives as well. So, but they roughly the same <coughs> format for the roof, for the actual building blocks and the height of them. And these are the previously refused Winchester Road elevations. As you can see, it's a <coughs> more imposing and very dense um, scheme along that elevation. The current northern block elevations are, it's been reduced in scale and you can see it's been set down into the ground to introduce uh, some undercroft parking. It was about 1.3, 1.5 metres into the ground so that the overall scale of the building above the ground is two storey. And that compares to the previous elevations, which is the full three storey block of flats on, on that site. Just to introduce some street scenes for as it would be. You can see that they've broken up the elevation here along the Winchester Road, though obviously the northern block would be visible through that that gap, but there would be more space for trees and landscaping. And that contrasts with the previous fuse proposals, which was predominantly three storey and no gaps or any views through the site. In terms of how it will sit in the landscape. We've got photos. This is taken from the southwest of the site, looking towards, you can see Fox's Garage, which is the building there, and the youth hall here. So it's all very low key at the moment, and that looks towards the centre of uh, Bishop's Waltham. This is further towards the site, so you can see more clearly the site there, the trees in the background and the historic centre of Bishop's Waltham, just to the side there. So looking from the site towards Bishop's Palace, so all the trees, and then back from that side of the road towards the site. See that it's not a, not a thing of beauty at the present time. These are the site from Winchester Road. This is the townhouse, which is a listed building immediately adjacent to the site. These houses are in Brook Road, Brook Street. And that's the Foxes building there. And then that's taken slightly further away, just in context, and further away again from the roundabout. So we've got Foxes building there, historic centre of Bishop Jordan there. And you can just see, I think that's the youth hall there. Looking north from Fox's Garage towards Southfields Close, you can see the trees along the boundary there. And looking across the northern boundary of the site towards Brook Street, 
that's the previous NHS building with Fox's garage behind it. These were taken at the end, earlier in the year, obviously, when the trees weren't in leaf. And again, looking towards the site to Southfield's close and the existing buildings. And this is looking out towards the former budgets down Sainsbury's with the bungalows on Malt Lane facing the site. This shows you, this was taken previously, the, the extent of trees <coughs> along the boundary of the site with South, one Southfield close, winter and summer, which gives you an indication of the level of screening. And again, this is the existing wall which will be removed. This is the townhouse here on the edge of the site with I think it's five and seven of the Esbrook Street. That's looking back towards the south from the townhouse, so it will be set behind there. And at present, you can't get through, so it's a nice large coop clear of it through that, and that would form the secondary access to the site if it is developed under the current scheme. Sorry, nearly there. Um, I took this through the gate, so um, it's just a very scruffy area at the moment, so it's not used for anything. It's taken across the frontage of five and seven towards the site. You can just see the top of Fox's garage there and a beech tree, which is considered to be of importance, which is located there on the boundary. To um, some, these are some um, visual CGI's taken that were provided off the site to try and show you the difference in appearance. So, from Winchester Road, south from Malt Lane, well, Southfield's close, looking back towards the site, is existing and proposed. This is Malt Lane Junction, Manchester Street View, Northwest, and proposed. And that's possibly one of the more significant views here because you do have this townhouses um, in place of statutory taller townhouses in place of the very low key buildings on the site currently. Um, some, one of the problems with the site is it's considered that the usable residential amenity area isn't, isn't really fit for purpose in terms of being able to obtain enough light. And a shadow study was produced, which I think even at the height of summer, you can see that the houses along which are three straight four bedroomed houses along Winchester Road will have very little light in their own usable garden areas to the rear and the northern block will also be significantly shaded for most of the day on the northern elevation. Again that just demonstrates the level of shading internally at variety of days so there is very early in the morning light but other than that it isn't great. He has acknowledged that the proposal is significantly better than the previous um, scheme that was put forward but it's still considered that the overall scale and design details would have an adverse impact on the conservation area um, and the amenities of future occupants and therefore the recommendation is for a refusal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les. Right, we move now to the public speaking. And the first person to speak is an objector, Vivian Jury. Good afternoon. Um, I forgot, um, members of the public, to point out that this um, is being live recorded and live streamed on the website. 
and um, also it is being um, filmed and the film will be on um, the council's YouTube site at a later point. Um, but I'm sure you probably know all that. So, um, Mrs. Jury, you have three minutes. And would you like to see where the clock will be? You can see it's in the left-hand corner of the screen. And we'll take it back to three. So when you're ready, are you ready? You press the button and then a red light comes on. Yep. And now you're ready. So, yeah. Thank the you. The clock will start once you start speaking. Good afternoon. Um, we all agree the Mort Lane site is overdue for development, but that said, it has to be done properly. The current application contravenes the Bishop's Waltham Village design statement and doesn't consider the historic aspect of the site and will significantly alter the outlook of this sensitive part of the village. <coughs> the impact will be felt long after the developers have moved on to their next project. There is quite some overwhelming anxiety from neighbours that their concerns are being ignored. The residents of Southfields Close, North Lane and Brook Street are worried about the amount of cars that the development will generate and become the overflow for those unable to park on the new site. They are already suffering from increased all day parking by people who work in the village who don't wish to pay to use the public car parks. There are daily issues of people, people blocking driveways and inconsiderate parking, making it difficult for red, residents to drive in and out of their <coughs> properties. What is being proposed is too much on a small site, and little thought has been given how it will impact the daily lives of the neighbours. I would like to ask the committee um, one point. The beech tree that was referred to, um, we now know what um, is proposed. It's a 12 metre beech tree that sits on the boundary. And we've been asking for a number of years to please ensure the tree is protected during development. We've now been told the developers will be removing the branches on one side of the tree as they need to erect scaffolding up to the boundary wall. The trunk of the tree is on the boundary, meaning branches will be cut back to the trunk on one side. Removing one scaffolding limb on a mature tree would not cause an imbalance, but removing all limbs plus the root disturbance will make the tree possibly unstable. The tree is next to garages and cars, and should it fall or work need to be carried out due to disease caused by the removal of the branches, um, we would like to know who would be responsible, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there might be some questions of clarification from members of the committee. But it doesn't look like it. So thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. Um, Parish Council representative is Councillor Ford. Good afternoon. And um, you were clear where the three minutes of counting down from. And when you're ready, the time will start. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for many years, the Mulvane site has been an eyesore in the attractive town of Bishop's Waltham. It presents passers by with a number of temporary buildings and an industrial unit that are deteriorating as time passes. We believe that this proposal will significantly improve the approach to Bishop's Waltham, the medieval market town, and will make a positive contribution to the local environment. The current planning application is for 24 residential units. There's a range of dwelling types, the majority being two and three bed homes, and addresses the need within Bishop's Waltham for smaller dwellings that are suitable for smaller family units, which are in short supply. The replacement youth hall is a real need in the town as the current building is barely fit for purpose, causing the local food bank and other users to seek other premises. The application proposes the retention of this important facility the loss of which would have a detrimental impact on the users, particularly the younger generation, as alternative similar facilities are not currently available. The site is in the conservation area of Bishop's Waltham and opposite the scheduled ancient monument, the Bishop's Palace. It is also next to the Grade Two listed building of the townhouse. Because of this, the developer and the parish council have endeavoured to secure a design that complements the area and does not detract from the important surroundings. 
We know that there are concerns expressed about the density of the site. Not far away is a similar development, South Brook News, which has no gardens and which works very well. This proposal is located in an area which has good access to facilities <coughs> and public transport and therefore should be acceptable under Winchester City Council's own policy. We are grateful to Country Homes for taking into account the comments made by the Parish Council and individuals to ensure that the development meets the high quality design standards required on the sensitive site, which would be acceptable to the majority of residents in Bishop Sorden. The proposal we believe does not detract from the conservation area and recognises the need to protect the distinctive setting. Of significant importance to the Parish Council is the fact that the current planning application meets all the policies that are applicable in the Bishop's Warden Design Statement produced in 2016 and adopted by Winchester City Council. We have provided a summary of this in our detailed comments, which have been submitted to this committee. We have suggested two amendments regarding the frontages of the terrace cottages and the roof line of the youth hall. With these two alterations to the final design, the Parish Council urges this committee to support the overall proposals for the Mulpain site to develop this ugly, dilapidated, Brownfield site and to approve this proposal for one of the most important developments in Bishop's Walden in recent years. One which will significantly improve the approach to Bishop's Walden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for um, Councillor Ford? Councillor Bentford? Thank you very much. Um, just management clarification, so I know where we are. Um, where is the conservation area? How, how big is it? I'm not not aware of it. If I may, I'm going to pass you to uh, our executive officer, Lindsay. I'm afraid, as much as I've tried to catch up on this, I'm the, I'm the newest member of the council. <laughs> so if I may pass it to Lindsay. Councillor Bento, I'm the case officer can answer that question in a minute. Uh, it covers um, the whole area of that map. Pardon? It covers the whole area of that map. Yes. And those. yes. Because the whole area of what? Yes. Yeah, we'll get the case officer to oh, yeah, in a fine. minute. Um, any other questions for Councillor Ford? Can Councillor Um I noticed the parish council have made no reference to the said tree by which Mrs. Jerry um, was saying. Uh, has the parish council any thoughts on that? Thank you. Any other questions? So we thank you very much, um, Councillor Paul, for coming along today. We move to Ward Councillor Slot. And I'll just preface this by saying, Councillor Miller, yes, of course you can speak, but the system is that you have to register for every application. And I believe, because you're not on our list today, and I believe you thought you would automatically be moved over from the last one. That's not the case. No, I, I did register. I had an email. In fact, I'm on your list for the next case, by mistake. OK, well, not to worry. <laughs> I did preface it by saying, of course, you can speak today. So when you're ready, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this application. This site has been an eyesore and blighted approach to British Wharton for many years. The youth hall is over 50 years old. I know that because I went there 50 years ago. The building is a temporary building and despite the efforts of the trustees and the volunteers over the years, it's worn out. The former physiotherapy centre hall is also very old and the Fox buildings looking in a very poor and terrible state would be the polite version. There are concerns by residents from Southfield, Cloaks and Brook Street about the adequacy of parking to being provided. This is a common problem on many applications across the entire district. However, this site is near the High Street and the Sainsbury store and Bishop's Wharton Square where the buses go from and there are two large car parks in Bishop's Wharton plus the Jubilee Hall. The vast majority of people believe this scheme is acceptable and welcome as an improvement to the area. Over the years as a parish councillor and a city councillor, I've seen many proposals for this site. All of the earlier ones have come to nothing for various reasons. If the proposal is not accepted, but it's very unlikely that anything will be done to this site for the foreseeable future, as the proposal has to be viable and as the state department 
report confirms, the cost of such proposals are rising rapidly, and at the moment, making alternatives is difficult, if not possible, to deliver. The committee recently passed the former petrol station as a car wash just along from this site, which is hoping to see the area improved, and it would be good for Bishop Swarton to have this application site tidied up, improved, and enhanced in the conservation area. At the moment, it detracts from the whole appearance of Bishop Swarton. The proposal is accepted by both English Heritage and the Bishop Swarton Society, and is welcomed by many residents and the parish council. It will undoubtedly improve the approach to Bishop Swarton, as well as providing houses near the middle of a town. I therefore hope the committee will respect the wishes of the people of Bishop Swarton and approve this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for Councillor Mellor? <laughs> no. So thank you very much, thank Councillor you. Miller, for coming along today. Um, Liz, did you want to pick anything up? And there was a question from Councillor Bentash about the conservation area. Could you, is it possible for you to just show us? Um, certainly, in the conservation area, as um, as stated, covers the entire area within the map of, um, well, pretty much, yes, most of the area up to the edge of Sainsbury's and to the north, south and east as far as it's shown on that map, so, yeah. Yeah, so quite a large area. Um, anything else you want to add? Chair, Chair, may I? I think you've forgotten to hear from the um, supporter. Sorry, there's still a supporter who wants to speak. He's down on your list. Oh, you? yes. Thank so you. sorry. So sorry, Mr. Francis, Mr. Rutter. Um, I've got ahead of myself. So, yes, I've missed out the supporter. Um, and I have two names down. Um, Tom Francis is the applicant and um, Adrian Rutter. And are you together? And are you sharing the... Um, yes, we'll, we'll, sh we'll share the three minutes. Um, okay. I'll, I'll talk first if I may. Yeah, okay. okay. Right, fine. Okay. So whenever you're ready, whoever's starting yeah. first, yeah. off you go. Good afternoon. Um, I, my name's Adrian Rutter and I'm speaking briefly on behalf of the Youth Hall Trustees. Um, the, the current Youth Hall is over 50 years old and lacks modern facilities and is really on borrowed time. Uh, we've been seeking a solution for the last 15 years or so without coming up with anything viable. Uh, we made some temporary roof repairs about eight years ago after we received a one-off bequest, um, but it's unlikely we will be able to fund any further temporary uh, patching. The development would provide a substantial, substantial benefit to us it meets all the youth club requirements, provides a fully up-to-date facility for use by the whole community, and will allow us to generate income to fund the local youth club, both for Bishop's Waltham and surrounding villages. Without the development, the current youth hall will undoubtedly deteriorate further, and it's unlikely to be viable for more than a few years. Thank you. There are just two reasons for refusal put forward by the case officer. This application is a result of a significant design testing. All statutory consultees are content that this provides a sensitively considered scheme that will fully respect the site's historic and modern context with significant public benefits. An exhaustive contextual analysis was undertaken to achieve the design, which includes many other examples of successful developments in Bishop's Waltham, which are significantly larger, taller, and certainly of greater massing. Historic England, English Heritage and the Museum Trust all support the scheme. The conservation area has, officer has concluded that the scheme would cause less than substantial harm. This is the lowest on the scale. The outward facing perimeter blocks very importantly reinstate the historic arrangement of the site and historic relationship to the adjoining townhouse and square. But with the building stepped back and away from the townhouse to ensure views of that building and to the square are fully maintained. The buildings also fully follow local design features from height, mi mixed roofs, arrangements, materials and detailing. Over 10,000 square foot soft landscaping will be provided, which equates to 31% of the site. This is significant in any scheme, but especially for such a town centre location. The officer's assessment that there is less than substantial harm 
to the conservation area and the townhouse must be weighed against the significant and far-reaching public benefits of the scheme. The garden sizes are larger than numerous examples in Bishop's Waltham. The scheme has received overwhelming local support and will enhance a site which has been an eyesore for the last 20 years and will bring, it, bring with it the remediation of a contaminated site, a new community facility, improved sustainable drainage, the use of high quality materials, new public links. Oh, he's still there. <laughs> uh, a biodiversity net gain of 122%, a highly sustainable scheme that includes eco roofs, terraces, and living walls. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, any points of clarification from either Mr. Francis or Mr. Rotter? No? Thank you very much. And apologies again for almost missing you out. Um, I have a question, though, and it's to do with affordable housing. Um, and it is a great regret to me that you can't see your way to including um, affordable housing in such a large development. Wow. Yeah, yeah, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, so we we try very hard. There's a lot of constraints with this site. So we're building a new facility for the youth club as part of the deal. The benchmark land value for the units that were on site were very high. This isn't just a green field that's worth, you know, £50,000 um, to have a horse on it. Um, and the site is heavily contaminated with hydrocarbons. Fox Garage used to be um, a, a diesel petrol station for coaches. Um, and the tanks are still underground and all of the water there to demonstrate it. Um, and we have submitted a viability appraisal along with the application, which has been scrutinised fully by Winchester City Council. And um, Ms Marsden went back and double checked that it, it definitely didn't comply. And that was again confirmed. Um, I mean, we're at a point now where if if we if we can't get this, this type of massing on the site, we won't even be able to bring the site forward without even the opportunity of um, having a, a zero affordable homes. Um, it really is on a knife edge. Okay. And the same reasons then apply to off-site contributions towards affordable homes? Correct. Okay. Members, any more questions? No. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming along today. Liz, anything you want to pick up? No. Um, so shall we look at the principle of development? which is on page 158159. Um, yeah, 158159. Councillor Prompt. Uh, sorry, I missed the um, when you asked him whether we had any questions from um, the officer. Um, did you reference to the Councillor Prompt, your microphone's not on, so oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I forgot. Thank that's you. you just said, that's all right. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the, the officer a question, please. Sorry, I, I missed that. I, I didn't hear you say when we had the opportunity to do that. Um, it's because the, um, the report makes reference to potential alternatives, and it's unclear to me if we were minded to, um, to approve this, which of the alternatives we would be giving our support to. Um, and so, um, yeah, we do. Can that be clarified for me? Yes. I mean, this, the application is recommended for refusal, as yes. you know. So that's part of a valid question. So do we go through the voting procedure and then where, what, what role do the alternatives? We were shown parish council preferred alternative. So what's I think, Chair, we can't really give you a view on alternatives. We can only assess this one, can't we, today? So there's the yeah. recommendations to refuse. But so what would else? happen if the committee voted in favour? Then you'd be approving the scheme that's in front of you. But, yes, but they did provide alternatives and have expressed a very clear plan support. But that's not what's in front of us today. Is that correct? Um, I. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, when talking to the agent, they are happy to with any of the alternative. But you know, we we were going on the ones that we were originally submitting. 
resources. We can't um, have a picky mix, Chair. The application that we've got in front of us is the one we've made our recommendation on to you, which is to refuse. So if you were minded to overturn us, then you'd be granting permission for the scheme that's in front of yeah. you and nothing else, Chair. Thank you. I've got to say, Chair, I'm completely confused now. I thought the alternatives were actually the application. No. Oh. Well, um, I apologise if my presentation was confusing. I provided, as part of it, the previous refused consent um, elevations of those, um, just as a, a, a contrast to what we have, what we are dealing with now. But in two of the elevations of what is currently proposed, the applicants did also put forward alternatives which have pretty much the same form and mass, but different elevational treatments in the um, introduction of render. So, I, but my understanding is that page 177 is what is in front of us for discussion. Um, and the parish preference is on page 178. It's the same bulk and form of building, but with different elevation or treatment. Yes, and, and I think it could be dealt with by billions of materials. So it's, it's, it doesn't affect the volume of accommodation provided or the massing of the buildings. It is primarily surface treatment. I think you're certainly confusing quite a few of us now. Um, so somebody give me a definitive um, answer. What are we, what is the substantive here on which your reasons for refusal have been based? Right. In terms of malt lane elevation, the one that we're considering was 177, page 177. So that is primarily brick and tile. Yeah. And then for the Winchester, Winchester Road, the it was brick, tile hanging and tile. So that's page 118. Okay. Are we all clear? I think, Chairman, if I would add that if you are minded to approve this today, it would be based on the, the, the plans that Liz has just read out, but there would be an opportunity for variance of materials, but not elevation or form and mass. It would just, you know, there would be some scope for, yeah. I noticed some of the elevations on the parish's preference are uh, rendered um, yeah. and equally on, on the elevation to, um, I think it's Winchester Road, you know, the alternative. That, they're not exactly the same, so it would only be a, a matter of changing the materials, Chair. In a way, it seemed very confusing showing us alternatives, because that's not what the refusal and what we're voting on. Um, anyway, are we all clear now? I appreciate that, but it felt the parish have commented very strongly, so I thought yeah. possibly it would be worthwhile putting their preferences forward. But. Okay. But there is no question of, that, of those alternatives at the moment coming forward because what's in front of us is um, from what you've just said, the 177, was it, um, 180. 177, 180 is what we're considering. Any more questions on yeah. principal of development? Chair, thank you. It's really just a follow on to, to the conversation that's just been had. Would it not be possible, if we were minded to approve, for us to do so with a condition that the surface treatments proposed by the, or approved by the, the, the parish council be uh, an acceptable option. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think I'm um, certainly 
elevational treatments, i.e., brick and you know, renderings of brick and things like that. Yes, I think there would there is, but there isn't because we're recommending refusal. But if members are minded to approve this, there would obviously need to be a series of, of conditions and, and, and materials and fenestration treatments would be one of those. So yeah, very much so. But probably not change of built form, renovation, or uh, massing or anything. But, but if we look at the reasons for refusal on page 166, a lot of it is um, scale and height and policies and overdevelopment of the site. Both schemes um, have that, don't they? They both have overdevelopment. Yes, the alternatives don't actually, with the exception of one of them, which just changes the roof pitches, the yeah. volume of building and the form of the blocks on the site and the site coverage is the same in all alternatives. Yeah. So we're looking yeah. at the overall impact of this level of building on this site. Okay. Councillor Pearson. Oh, I said earlier I was confused. I'm completely even more confused. We seem to be looking at three alternatives. What was, which was turned down, what a proposal is, and I can't make out which which that is, and the alternative suggested by the Parish Council makes me begs the question exactly what took place during the pre-application advice as to why we haven't a one coherent picture to see actually what this application is. I don't I have no idea. Okay. I'm, I'm clear, but I will let an officer explain. Um, well, I, I apologise for the confusion. The, I felt it was reasonable to show what had been refused previously because if I don't, I always ask that question. So I think I'd have them out there. Um, in terms of the element, if you could think of it as building blocks and not so much the, the render, whether it's brick or tile or the surface materials, the volume of building on the site is the same in each of the proposed alternatives. It, that doesn't change. There's, it's the same number of units, the same number of openings, window openings, and the same height in all of the alternatives. The only difference being the treatment of, of, of the elevations, like whether it's tile or render, and that is where the differences are. But the actual volume of building on the site is the same in each case. And the reasons for refusal, am I right, are the scale, height, um, layout, not necessarily well, the design, yes, but not materials, plus the overdevelopment of the site, creating cramped living environments. And that that is in the same in whichever option you look at. Yes. So the Parish Council alternative. But still, I just, I've got to be careful now. I've not been being considered twice already about it's, this. It's not being considered today as possible. It's this not is not what the application today. is. But in terms well, of its scale, height, it would yeah. still be unacceptable. Yes, I, I understand that. So. I'm, I'm with you on that, though. This is just that I was, well, are you saying the Parish Council alternative has no status at all? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, no okay. it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, no, I, I can go with that. <laughs> I hope that's what it I know. I, I think it has to be into that. I feel it would be better if we hadn't seen, I know the Parish Council have put an awful lot of effort into it, but it would have been better if we hadn't seen the alternative, because it's muddied the waters for some of us. But we're still on um, principle of development. Um, Councillor Reid. Jim, would, we, would it be fair to say, and I'm sorry, I had my hand up for some time, um, that the treatment of any building by its finished materials can actually alter, may well be the same size, but because of the treatment of it, of its materials, it can make a, a total difference, a more acceptable difference. I don't think that will alter the current um, living conditions. Do you want to answer that, Liz? I, yes, it can be a material difference, but I think the elevations that we have in front of us are actually the officers' references. <laughs> so rather than so, what we're looking at would, I think, 
be our preferred option if it was going to be recommended to the Commission, which it isn't due to the various other factors. If that makes sense. Right, and the next um, heading is design and layout. Chair, Chair, before we move on to that, I just wanted to point out that given this isn't a conservation area and that you have to have special regard to the heritage arguments, we do have our conservation officer remotely. Oh, and, right. and I wonder whether it's something that any of the members who've had any questions in relation to yes. heritage arguments, as she is available, and I presume listening as we said. There's Rachel, isn't yeah. it? Yes. It's there remotely. I wasn't aware of that, but good afternoon, Rachel. Good afternoon. She's got away. She didn't respond. Quiet. All right. I'll turn the Do you have any comments? You've listened to the councillor's comments. Do you have any comments? Thank you, Chair. It may be something that's more relevant. The critical point, really, from the conservation area perspective, is the fact that. Uh, we have identified that proposals would result in less than substantial harm, and that is not contested by the applicant. They agree with that conclusion. So the critical consideration really is whether public benefit would outweigh the harm that's been identified. Um, and obviously, I would remind members that we do have a statutory duty under Section 72 of the 1990 Act to have special regard to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the character and appearance of the conservation area and that that obviously is also upheld in paragraph 199 of the NPPF. Any, any member have a question for Rachel? Well, yes, if I might. Yes, yeah. Councillor Pearson. Are you suggesting, Rachel, it's Councillor Pearson speaking, are you suggesting, Rachel, that it is possible, although unlikely, there could be archaeological remains under this site, and therefore uh, you're suggesting a watching brief? I think that's good. Um, and the archaeologist's consultation response, Councillor Pearson, I, I think that, that might be the conclusion, but I would need to double check that. OK, thank you. Any more questions for the conservation officer? Did you want to speak, Liz? No. no, but I can answer the archaeological bit if that would be of any help. Oh, well, we're not on that yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so we'll move off the design and layout. And now we're on impact on the character of the area, page 160, Um, Councillor Venter, sorry, just get, got caught up in the historic yeah. England. Uh, I look at the top of page 162 and I'm struggling to understand how we can say it's got less than substantial harm and then a bit later on we use the word it's going to be significant. Now significant to me means quite harmful but you know, I'm, I don't know how you use these words but probably they're used in a planning officer's language that I would need to understand. And to yeah. me, substantial and significant mean very much the same sort of thing. Chair, I wonder if it would be useful to hear from Rachel on that again, yeah. because it is a matter of national policy, uh, that phraseology, you're very right there, but I think so, you know, we need a historic environment specialist to to help you understand those, those very definitions, Chair. So I think we should hear from Rachel again on that. Rachel, if you can help explain that, please. So Rachel, we're calling on your expertise again um, um, to explain the less than substantial harm statement. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the NPPF uses the term substantial or less than substantial when making an assessment in terms of if there is any harm to um, the special interest of the heritage asset, whether that's um, normally in this respect in terms of conservation areas. Um, you have to think of, of, of it as a sliding scale, if you like, um, with less than substantial being at the lower end and substantial being at the higher end. 
just because um, something is identified as being of less than substantial harm doesn't mean it's of no harm or doesn't mean it's acceptable. It is still harmful. It is just less than substantial. Now, the NPPF defines substantial harm as harm that is so severe that it goes to the, to the core of the reason for designating that asset. So the development within the conservation office area to um, result in substantial harm, it would need to be so harmful that it would really harm the core reasons for the designation of that conservation area as a whole. So it's quite rare to have development that is substantial or would result in substantial in a conservation area for those reasons. Most development would be varying degrees of less substantial. The term significant comes in when we're trying to grade that less than substantial harm. So is it really, really less than substantial, as in negligible, or is it more severe than that? So by using the term significant, what we're trying to say is, yes, it would be less than substantial harm because it wouldn't go to the core of the reason for designation, but it would still be significant harm. It, it, it's a very complicated subject matter. I appreciate that. So if members need some more clarity, please do say. OK, thank you. And could well, I, I ask I, I, you? Thank, thank, thank for that answer. I understand that. But to my mind, as a mathematician, why not just have a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> right, because that's what the national policy is. <laughs> Could I ask you, Rachel, um, about the English, um, well, the historic England, who objected to the previous um, application, but this one they're saying is an improvement, but that there still is harm attached to it, particularly to views. Is that correct? So they're not actually supporting this scheme, are they? Rachel? Thank you. Um, I might need to double check this with uh, Liz as the case officer, but the, the historic England comment in relation to impact on the conservation area, they don't comment on specifically in relation to this application. Um, their response date of the 3rd of March um, they acknowledge that they had commented previously in relation to impact on the conservation area, but what they say is they have no specific comments regarding the conservation area or undesignated archaeology, so that they don't really draw any conclusions or give an opinion. Well, what about the statement, or is that English heritage, then, that say that the, this would impact negatively on the monuments? A sense of isolation and tranquility. That's a, that's a different organisation than English Heritage Trust. So th there is concern, uh, I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to get to. There is concern from um, conservation heritage um, bodies. Is there? Sorry, Chair. Did, did you hear the question, Rachel? Sorry, Chair. Yeah, yes, there, there is. Um, it's referred to relate more to the setting of the Bishop's Palace. Um, and because that site is a scheduled monument, and because scheduling takes precedence to listing, I kind of deferred to our archaeologist Tracy Matthews to comment in relation to impact on the setting of the Bishop's Palace, but you're correct, concerns have been expressed in regard to views of that monument. Okay, are we done with that section? Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we've got now to impact on neighbour amenity. Starts on page 162 and goes on to 164. No questions? Then we've got landscape and trees and highways and parking. Councillor Pearson? Um, regarding parking on the site, <coughs> um, Liz, I think you, you said earlier that the 
previous application had been turned down because of inadequate parking. Uh, in your estimation, how much parking is actually provided on this site? Uh, and are you likely to get an overspill into the neighbouring close and indeed into Sainsbury's car park? Um, I did set it out. There is a shortfall of parking compared to our residential standards for this site. Mm. The judgment call is we are trying to leave people away from car ownership. Is it a sustainable location? Are there, is there public transport? And they did put forward a good case to suggest that Bishop Waltham had generally fewer than one um, an average of one car per household, regardless, mm. that was all in the transport statement. And whilst we should be encouraging people not to use cars and where it's within skipping distance of the shops and all the rest of it, yeah. it's considered that it's an acceptable location in which to, I mean, each property can have has at least one space and that includes some spaces for the youth hall. Mm. So it's not no parking, but it's, it is a short for above our standards. So it's sustainable regarding immediate needs, but questionable regarding commuting. Commuting, yeah, um, yeah. yes. Okay, thanks. Moving on to the end of the report, we've got archaeology, ecology, nitrate, um, and policy conclusion, and the conclusion. You were keen to tell us about archaeology today. It was just in response to the question. I mean, the the conditions do include programmes of archaeology to be undertaken um, or further investigation to be uh, undertaken. Sorry, <laughs> the, con the conditions submitted by our archaeologists did include, um, were included, but yes, if that were, should it be approved, there would be archaeological yeah. investigation. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so I think we've come to the end of the questions on the report. Cheers. So, sorry, you, I think your microphone's off. I think we've come to the end. Thank you. We've come to the end of the questions on the report. And so now we go into debate. Councillor uh, Bong. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that the um, key questions we've got to um, you know, think about, as opposed to it being very clear um, whether something's contrary to a policy, that we're going to be exercising our opinion as to whether there is successful integration or not, um, and whether the, the, there um, is significant overdevelopment. And um, I was encouraged to hear that um, there's a balance to be struck between public benefit um, and whether it outweighs the harm. Um, and in my view, as a person that passes that site regularly, the existing arrangements are, are to be really to the detriment of the, the conservation area. Um, and I was very encouraged that the parish council and the ward councillor are supportive of the um, proposal um, I have to guard my, or, or be careful with the language, because I, I too favour the appearance that was favoured by the parish council. In other words, the, the use of the, the white rendering, um, and I think that does help with the integration and the, and the appearance of uh, the buildings within um, the, the, the wider uh, public area of the conservation area. And so um, I am minded to. Um, uh, to um, uh, uh, not to agree with the uh, the council uh, the um, officer's recommendation um, and to, to, um, to support the uh, application with um, the uh, uh, condition that uh, includes the sort of preference or consideration at least of the parish council's preferred style. Thank you. Could we just clarify this? The, the, the parish council option is not up for consideration today. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, 
I, I personally will not be voting um, for this scheme. I know this is better than what we refused before because I was present at that committee. And I know the residents are absolutely fed up with the dreadful dilapidation on that site. I go past this site uh, at least once, probably more than that, each day. And it is in a dreadful state. And I do feel very sorry in not supporting a new youth hall um, because obviously that desperately needs to happen. However, if we look at the reasons for refusal, we're talking about harm, um, really, to the conservation area. It's a gateway into British Waltham. Do we really want something which is just a whole mass of buildings? I like the fact that they've broken that mass up and they have um, a gap in the middle. I think that's the right way forward. Um, but then also the second reason um, a significant overdevelopment resulting in cramped living environments for residents. And as much as people want somewhere to live, I cannot vote for something which is going to provide them with a lower standard, um, which is what this will do. Um, it has an enormous amount of local support, probably because they, they too just want something to happen on this side. And I do urge, if this is the way it's going to go, I do urge the developer to, they had pre-application advice, so they knew that this might be the way it goes. Um, but I do urge the, the developer to come in with something which addresses these proposed reasons for refusal on page 166. But I can't possibly support this scheme. And just to reiterate, it's not the parish council scheme that's up for grabs. It is, you know, the, the, what, what we have in front of us. That was sort of interesting, red hair. Councillor Lee. Oh, right. Councillor Pearson, I thought you wanted to say. Yeah. Actually, you know, this is the my hand up for a while. Um, yeah, it's, it's confusing. Unfortunately, <coughs> Liz gives so much detail, it, it, it's a bit confusing, but I think. There's a clarification actually beginning to come through from what you said, Chairman. The difficulty is, is yes, it is a, uh, a conservation site, and it's conservation for three reasons. First, the medieval ponds that uh, came up at the last planning meeting when we were talking about the car wash uh, site. Uh, that was conservation, not only biodiversity, but they were medieval ponds, uh, that site is. The second one, the close proximity to the Bishop's Palace, uh, and the uh, Bishop's Waltham uh, Trust has seen the report uh, with the archaeological work they've done on site, it's a medieval burial ground as well. Uh, the Bishop's Palace is built by, I think, Bishop Wickham, if I recall rightly, and we've got strong links with Winchester at that time. It was a hunting palace. Uh, it's when he came and spent his holidays, if you like, as opposed to New Forest of the Royal um, Hunting Ground. The other reason for its conservation is, of course, the historic heart of Bishop's Waltham High Street, which is essentially about the buildings in the High Street. And when I look at what the proposal is, um, I do not see any compromise in any direction regarding the latter point, that it is close by historic building. Yes, you could point out blocks of flats on the other side of the pond, but they're outside the conservation area. This is not. And so there's got to be, as Liz quite rightly points out, there's got to be some acknowledgement regarding scale and massing of these buildings. No matter what the surface treatment is, it's the scale and massing that I must admit, I find, oh, uh, I'm sorry, while we need that housing as accommodation, but really you've gone too far over what is acceptable within a conservation site and the limitations brought by that. It's sustainable, yes, of course it is. It's next door to Sainsbury's, there's a co-op store in Bishop's Waltham, good uh, um, uh, butchers there, there's all sorts of shops in Bishop's Waltham. It's a regional centre. It's come down to parking issues. Because it's a regional centre, people very often travel out of Bishop's Waltham for their work. 
So it's not just the fact it's sustainable as a site because you can get all your food and shelter from that, you can. It's not sustainable and there's not enough employment coming. And they're already in the process of completing the building of uh, 500 houses that were allocated in the last round of Bishop's Hall. So this becomes crucial because of where it is, the sheer bulk. I must admit, when I looked at it, before I started to look at it, I thought, oh, crumbs, that's a bit much in that site because it is overpowering. It's taller than the historic buildings, it's taller than the Saints of Store, it's taller than the suburban development behind, it's taller than the palace walls on the other side of the road. So it is a significant viewpoint, and that is why Historic England didn't like it, even though the archaeological remains, and that's another issue, would have to be, if we might to pass it, it'd have to be a strong archaeological brief in the conditions. But summing up, I I like this confusion because I think it, it's, it just didn't fit in this location. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, any further contributions to debate? Councillor Leamy. Yeah, I Councillor Like uh, Councillor I am worried about the scale and massing of the buildings. Uh, at the same time, is that I think the parish council's suggestions were quite helpful, um, and I think the developer has gone some way to the signal has been set by the parish council. But unfortunately, we have the uh, plans today to go through which are presented to us in the form they have been, so therefore I cannot support this application at this particular time, um, which I do regret, because Bishop Paul can really need something done quickly. Um, Councillor Bento, sorry, I need someone else. Thank you very much. Um, I still find it very difficult to agree with this assessment of harm. It would seem to me it's going to be very difficult to build anything on this site that doesn't, in the eyes of people, cause harm to the, the whole area. It is a long way from the uh, palace site, and to me, building um, the proposal um, as it is seems far better than what is there already, uh, the absolute mess that it is, as you've already referred to. Um, we, we agreed last meeting to allow the uh, car wash place with its beautiful green chain fence, is it? It's, you know, surely that causes far more harm than these these proposals. So to me, we'd be contradicting ourselves if we weren't to allow this. I, I think the proposal has the, the liking of the local population or a large number of them. Yes, they are probably frustrated with the number of times that this is coming forward. But um, I, I can't, you know, we, we need to stop it somewhere and let's, let's get ahead and do something because otherwise this patch is just going to get worse and worse and worse and another proposal will come forward and again we'll say it's causing harm. So I, I'm going to vote for this proposal to go ahead. Councillor Edwards? Yes, I like um, Councillor Bento, have great sympathy for the people of Bishop's Walton and the planning blight that they seem to be living with and have been for some time. I'm also very well aware of the need for relatively modest accommodation units in the, in the town and, and beyond, and also uh, for the amenity space in the form of the, the youth club facilities. What this seems to come down to, however, is the phrase that the conservation, the phrase, the conclusion, the conservation area means that development should be of an exceptional standard. Now, my understanding of that would be that the design and the build quality need to be exceptional. And if that was the case, I would be happy to reject this plan. Uh, and say, go away and come back with a better plan, with a higher quality of design and build. But what I've heard through the discussion has been that exceptional isn't actually about, or only about design and build quality. It's about the sheer quantity of it, that there should be less, less height, <coughs> less bulk, 
and more open space. And with the information that we've been given, I'm quite challenged to see how a solution that would provide social benefits, but with considerably less bulk, could possibly be viable. And on that basis, I'm tempted to approve what we are presented with today. Uh, I'd be very happy in, in debate to, to hear anything more that's for anyone who, who could cast a view on what a suitably exceptional standard of viable development on this site might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Well, six members of the committee speaking. Um, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Joe. Bishop's Waltham is the largest community outside of the city itself. It toys sometimes with dead meat, but um, it really is the largest community. Its facilities are somewhat limited. Um, we've heard today about the youth hall, and an advantage with this particular application is that a new youth hall would be supplied. Sadly, against that would be the lack of affordable housing. Now, listening to the reasons about affordability and the violence itself, um, I don't think this site will ever be a vi viability site for um, <clears throat> for housing, for um, social housing. Um, I'm inclined to go with the idea that this is a good application. Yes, it is. Um, quite heavy in number, but I think it's not out of place, not totally out of place. Um, the treatment of structures, as I said earlier, can be vastly altered. Um, if you have an all brick or you put some other rendering in it, it can actually reduce and change the shape of, to some degree of a structure. The what I would like to have seen, Chair, is, and the question was asked, um, the conservation area. When we talk about conservation areas, is it possible that when they in, come into an application, we could actually have a plan showing the conservation areas that would make life a little bit easier? I'm inclined to go along with supporting this application, but against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm also torn on this in that um, there's a clear need for development in that area. Um, there's been iteration of these proposals and plans. Um, I hear everything that's said about this, the bulk of the area and the size of it, um, but equally I hear about the viability of developing this site as well, the issues that it's got in terms of the um, in the form of petrol station and everything needs to be cleaned up. I look at the level of support from the local community, from the Bishop's Walton Society, from the parish council, uh, tacit approval from the conservation team, the of England, etc. And I too am inclined to support this proposal. Thank you. Um, that's it. So this, this, um, has been recommended for refusal. If we, first of all, um, have a show of hands of those who are supporting the refusal of this application. Four members, Chair. And those who are not supporting the um, refusal? Five members, Chair. So that's everybody. So now we need to ascertain um, do we, what conditions need to be on an approval. Yeah. Chair, yes. may, may I suggest that the first thing you need to do is, as you are minded to overturn the officer recommendation, you need to have sound reasons for 
um, considering granting planning permission. Obviously, Julie will be able to guide you on the conditions, but you do, as you do with the, the reverse, you still have to have reasons for overturning the recommendation. Okay. So you have to have some. So reasons, about that. But, okay. Can I suggest, Chair, as well, that one of the reasons will need to very specifically relate to the um, arguments put forward by the Conservation Officer and the issue of substantial harm versus the public benefit. You will need to address that as well. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure that the, I'm not, not sure that the conservation officer gave us any reasons to overturn the officer's recommendation. So that will be a tough one. Defining what the words were rather than the reasons. Um, well, well, what I heard from those people who are supporting the approval is that they think the scheme is good. They're supporting the youth hall. Um, there is a lot of local support. Anything else? Yeah. Chairman, I think um, Ms Sutherland was, was leading you there. I think what, what uh, uh, from what I've heard, and, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong on this, because you do need to tell me uh, if I've interpreted it correctly, uh, the, the historical environment officer told you that you know that she and the applicant do agree that this proposal does represent less than substantial harm um, and her view and that's hence the recommendation to you that that, that didn't outweigh the public benefit i think what you're saying is it does out you know that less than substantial harm does outweigh the public benefit and therefore you're minded to recommend re approval on that basis subject to a series of planning conditions now obviously that's my words that's not my recommendation, so it needs to be your word. So I think that that's probably, uh, you know, if, if that's what your view is, then that would probably be uh, the reasons why, in addition to what Councillor Evans has said, that you believe the scheme to be an acceptable one, uh, the other benefits that accrue, um, and, and that support for it, and you would like to see this um, site developed, Chair. Is that sufficient? Anyone want to add anything there? Lack of affordable homes. Oh, well, that's not a reason for overturning the well, exactly, exactly. Many of the points in favour are not material to planning policy, and this is the big difficulty. Yeah, I, I, I agree. know it's all very quiet and then ask for conditions for this, um, which is interesting. I think, Chair, given what you're saying, we basically need to address the reasons for refusal and why you think those reasons for refusal have been overcome in relation to this application. Well, may I ask the members who voted to approve this application to contribute to this conversation? Yeah. Very, That's very, very, one. very happy to um, to assist in that in that respect. Um, in my opinion, the scale, height, and layout weren't so um, uh, adverse as, as to be um, a problem with the successful integration of the development with the locality, and therefore. Um, you know, what I'm saying is that those those three words um, were not sufficiently dis you know, um, disadvantageous to cause me to to um, re uh, you know, re um, refuse the application. Um, the conservation um, uh, officer specifically referred to a balance um, of public benefit against the harm. And that's why, in my view, the public benefit prevailed, um, and the uh, the harm um, was uh, discussed, and it was not as great as highways, uh, not highways England, um, historic England, and um, English heritage. Um, uh, uh, Pine, this this scheme was not as bad as um, a previous one, which was nearer um, and had the bulk without the, the, the passageway. And therefore, um, the, 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 the steps that had been taken were sufficient to enable, in my view, it to be satisfactorily integrated. And therefore, we don't have to come up with um, other special reasons. Um, the, the, um, the hurdle for rejecting it wasn't met. Chair, can I just remind the committee that you do have to have reasons for um, overcoming, overturning the officer recommendation um, it's standard practice in, in planning applications that if you make a decision, you have to be able to justify the decision. Uh, and where you are taking a different view to the officer recommendation, as you are here, you do have to be able to be clear what, what your reasons are for making that decision. Thank you. Councillor Edwards, anything to add? Because you were 
One of the councillors that voted to approve it? Certainly, but my understanding, I think it's been well expressed by Councillor Brock. Uh, we were, I, I understand that the proposal is not sufficiently contrary to the conservation requirements to be out of the question. It is not, what was the phrase yeah, that we used, this, substantial, it is not causing substantial harm. It we're looking causing, at the reasons for refusal on yeah. page 166. Yeah, exactly. So Councillor Bento, anything oh, from you? Basically, I just disagree. Um, with, with the statement that due to its scale, height, and height, layout, and design, it wouldn't successfully integrate with the locality. And frankly, I just disagree with that statement. So I say the opposite. I think it will fit in. It is the entrance to the town centre there. The town centre is a quite a crowded area, um, so it fits in quite nicely, and it would give a a, a modern look to the entrance to Bishop's Waltham far better than the old cabins that are there at the moment and uh, anything else that goes there. So, yes, it's, it's sort of a, very difficult to say anything well, else other than that. You've heard what the legal advice is. Councillor Westwood, would you like to contribute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my view is that the scheme put forward as presented today uh, in relation to the previous scheme is considerable improvement on what was put forward before. I like the way that the buildings have been separated. The 31% of the space is, is not built on, it's green space, as we've talked to us now. I, I believe that incorporating improved youth facilities is a fantastic thing for, for the area as well. We're going to use, lose that youth hall. You've heard about the um, dilapidated state that's in. I'm worried about that. I think the overall scheme for that area fits in with the area, and I, I do contest in terms of scale height, that uh, layout design points. My opinion is that that does fit with the area and can be made to fit and has substantial benefits for the community. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Reed? I think basically, Chair, and what we've been saying, Mrs. Pinnock hit the nail on the head to right at the very beginning. Um, yes, I disagree with reasons for refusal as one. I think, in my own mind, that it will fit in. Um, and depending on how you treat the buildings, I think will also have a large effect. So that is my reasoning. Mrs. Bogland, have we satisfied your legal requirement? Do you think probably has enough to give you some guidance as to what your reasons might mm -hmm. look like? Yeah, thank you. I think um, it, it goes back to, as I said at the beginning, I think whilst we all accept that there is less than substantial harm because that is proven, uh, you think that the public benefits outweigh that harm uh, and therefore that they won't have a detrimental in impact to the um, character and appearance of the conservation area or the adjacent uh, list of buildings. Um, and equally on the reason for refusal too, you don't believe that it results in a cramped living environment for residents. Uh, doesn't have an adequate uh, amenity space and therefore in your view it does respond positively to the local environment and its neighbours uh, and, and does provide an attractive and distinctive place so I think you know you're turning those reasons around aren't, aren't you to the, to the, to the positive. Um, I think in terms of uh, taking this forward chair obviously you'll, you'll probably need to, to, to have another vote I think on, on um, that members are have gone against the officer recommendation therefore you're you know, as a majority minded to approve. Uh, what we'll need to do, Chair, on that basis is go away and have a, a think about relevant conditions. And also I, I'm thinking about the uh, the public benefit that you're giving quite a lot of weight to. I think we would need to secure that via Section 106 legal agreement, because otherwise I'm not uh, confident, Chair, of how we could ensure that was delivered as part of the package of the scheme. So I think, you know, uh, if, you, if you're minded to vote to approve it now, following uh, the overturn of the recommendation to refuse, uh, perhaps you would delegate that to your officers to agree with you. Uh, a section 106 would be entered into with the, the service lead legal uh, and
and a series of conditions for your officers to put together to secure some of those other things that we talked about, the materials, the archaeology, there's probably a whole list of other things that I can't quote now, Chair, without um, yeah. uh, doing a lot of work, but you know, there will be a series of conditions, there will be a Could conditional I just commission. check on the public benefits, because to my mind it's just the useful, which is sui generis anyway. What other public benefits are there? Yes, it is that. Yes, it is that useful. So that's protected in, under the sui generis. Uh, yeah, well, what I want to make sure is delivered, chair, as part okay. of the scheme. Yeah. So. So, um, chair, would that not also include the different views you would now have for new house because they pulled the. Uh, development back so you can actually view the new house. Is it called the new house? The town house, sorry. That, that, that is part of the setting of it. And um, at the present time, there isn't anything obstructing a view, so I'm not sure you could say that was a benefit in this particular case. Okay, so we've got to the point where we have a vote on approving this application with the conditions to be um, <laughs> thought about by Liz and Julie and um, Ron past me. Um, so all those in favour of approving this application, please share. Five members, Chair. And those against? Three against. Four. Four against, sorry. Four against. OK, so that application has been approved. Thank you very much. Members, do you want a little break? This is been about uh, an hour and a half. We need a turnaround anyway. It's going to be a long day. No answer. So when you're back, we start again.
of the Winchester City Council Planning Development Control. Um, members are sitting around the tables with their names up. Um, I'm Therese Evans, I'm the chair of the planning committee. And then we have the case officer always sits there, I'll introduce you then to him in a minute. Uh, Julie Pinnock, who's the head of the built environment section. Um, Fiona Sutherland, who's the our legal advisor, and Matthew Watson, who does the um, <coughs> talking for this committee. We're moving on to agenda item 12, which is um, 21 slash 01219 slash HMU, and it's Carlton Villa 10 Compton Road, and a proposed front extension to form additional living accommodation. Um, the case officer is Cameron Taylor, and when you're ready, Cameron, we're ready to hear your presentation. And Good. Councillor Edwards has absented himself. Um, he's and he's not in the room, has he gone? Left the room as well. He's just gone out here. Right, okay. Um, for for uh, personal reasons, declared in interest. Cameron? So thank you, Chair. I'd like to note a quick update uh, which relates to page four of my report under the paragraph titled Design Slash Layout. In the first paragraph, sentence number four, I note the projections need 7.8 metres from the dwelling. However, through my preparation for the committee, I know that it projects around 8.4 metres in total with a two-storey element being 7.2 metres, which I will highlight on the elevation of drawings. However, this does not alter the officer's recommendation for approval. And I'd also like to say that I've got Jennifer Malaport, who was the Historic Environment Officer, who provided the comments for the uh, for Historic Environment in regards to this application itself. So the proposal is for the, so the presentation for the proposed front extension forming the living accommodation to Tain Compton Road. Oh. <coughs> so here we have the location and site plan with the appearance of dwellings in the area sort of being of a rendered external appearance or facing brickwork, the previous developments have been extension, raising of a roof and the erection of a garage. And the the sort of the proposal is set back from the uh, from the front of number eight by about 8.4 meters and is set forward from number 12, which is to the east of the property, by about 3.3 meters. As is visible on the location plan, there is no set building line along Copter Road, as given the the uh, neighboring properties itself a variety of projections project forward of one another. And the proposal itself will retain a gap of two meters to the western boundary to number eight, and around 4.5 meters to the eastern boundary to number 12. Here we have an aerial photograph that shows the sort of residential and green nature of the area, the site marked by the yellow triangle. Followed by the south elevational drawings through the street scene, with the existing being top and the proposed being the bottom. But the proposal retaining landscaping to the front of the actual proposal, proposed extension itself, similar to what's there in the property already. We have next the elevation drawings, which is supposed to be a classical influence to respond to the immediate street scene of the Strangere and Compton Road, with the height being 6.2 metres from the, from the ground to from the ground at the front to the ridge line, to the ridge, with the width being 5.6 metres. Here we have a view from the south towards south elevation from the public ground from, from, from across the road, which we see the green inverted nature, which will be retained, whilst also retaining the break between number eight, which is on the right hand side of the photo, and number 12 towards the left. Here we have a view from within the site looking towards the south elevation of the property. Followed by the north elevation of drawings. However, these will not be readily visible from the public realm as due to the name, as due to the location of the extension itself. This will be blocked by the existing dwelling. Next, we have the east elevation drawings. So the proposal itself is situated below the eaves of the neighbouring properties, with no first floor glazing to the site elevation, along as, as well as being situated behind an existing boundary wall. Projection, as they coming from Coming from this element here, the projection to the very front of this extension is 8.4 metres, 
and from the same point to the two end of the two storey is 7.2 metres. Here we have a photo showing the east elevation from St James's Villa, which is further to the east, with the proposal proposal set itself being situated behind the property towards the end, which is Mouse Curse, so is currently there. Next, we have views looking towards the eastern boundary from within the site, followed by another photo. However, this one is focused more towards the eastern boundary, more towards number eight, the elevation number eight. Here we have the west elevation drawings. Similarly to the east, there are no first floor glazings. However, this does incorporate roof lights into the roofscape. However, these are the conservation roof lights and also high level, so will not be used for pit views. Here we have a photo showing the west elevation of the dwelling. Followed by the views looking towards the western boundary of the site. And here we have photos looking more towards the front of the property number 12, how it's still focusing towards the western boundary. Here we have the existing and proposed ground floor plans, and this shows the shows the intention to retain the, the planting to the front of the extension itself, as, as shown on the existing, as long as well as along the boundaries itself. Whilst the planting in the upcoming photos, which is situated within this area here, is potted planting and is sort of more in raised beddings, but however, there is sort of fairly paved areas to the front already. Here are the proposed first floor drawings with the windows to the rear in the proposal. One of them serves the staircase and landing with the window itself being situated 1.6 metres away from the actual first floor level with the staircase adjoining the actual, the actual window the wall is situated about two metres. So I'm height about two metres from the steps until the sill height, until the sill whilst the right-hand window itself serves an ensuite bathroom. Whilst the window to the front, single central window, directs the views towards the public ground. Next, we have the existing proposed roof plan, which we can see the proposed roof lights, as well as the extent of the proposed extension and the retention of outdoor amenity space to the property. Next, we have a photo looking towards the, looking to to the east towards the location of the proposal, in which the proposal will come off of this existing flat roof element of the property within this area here. Here we have a view to the north from within the parking to the site <coughs> itself, with some dense hedging to the front which will be retained as well as a tree. Followed by a look down the north, sorry, a look down from the north or down the boundary between the site itself and number eight. And the look towards the site from across the front of number 12 from the opposite side of the road. So therefore, the Oscar Foundation for approval following the assessment of the application in accordance with the planning policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we move now on to public speaking. Um, and the first person on our list is an objector, Alison Davidson. Hello, Alison. Um, and you have three minutes to give your presentation. Would you like to see where the clock is? The clock in the left hand corner. And we'll start it again when you, when you speak. So um, you have three minutes when you're ready to tell us whatever you want to say to us. I'm a professional conservation specialist speaking on behalf of a large number of local residents, including both directly neighbouring property owners. Objectors include a reputable retired conservation architect, ex-local government urban designer and others who care deeply about this part of Winchester conservation area. Contrast that with the applicant's agents who are engineers and not architects. The planning officer's recommendation is poorly judged and based on inadequate understanding of the heritage context and streetscape significance of the place and of the council's policies aimed at conserving the historic environment. 
There's been poor analysis and no real understanding of the historic site. The coach house was a service building for a main house. It has recently been altered badly, but its relationship as a service building set back behind the main house number 12 survives and contributes to the conservation area, which is characterised by similar houses with ancillary service buildings set far behind the building line. Despite the alterations to the setting, this relationship remains, but this new proposal destroys the important space between 12 and 8, which is one of the important characteristics of the conservation area as, as set out in page 45 of the conservation area character appraisal. Policy DM15, local distinctiveness, requires that the development respects the qualities, features and characteristics that contribute to the distinctiveness of the local area. The gaps between houses in the area give the street a sense of openness and low density development. Mm -hmm. Glimpses of trees and rear gables of buildings in St James's Villas and other streets are lost by this infilling. These issues and more mm -hmm. ensure that the proposal fails comprehensively to accord with the Council's own adopted policies and SPD high quality places. Moreover, it fails to meet the emphasis on good design in the new NPPF paragraph 134, which directs that development that is not well designed should be refused, especially where it fails to reflect local design policies and government guidance on design. This extension is poorly designed and has an incoherent relationship with the existing buildings on site. It offers a monolith in the applicant's own words, extending some three metres forward of 12 Compton Road, a building it should remain deferential to if historic character is to be conserved. This monolith presents nothing but pastiche, a misappropriation of individual architectural elements which combine to inaccurately attempt to mimic neighbouring architectural style and character. The resultant layout is a dog's dinner. The proposal represents a continued exploitation of the site and erosion of the historic pattern of development, its local distinctiveness, it wholeheartedly neglects good design principles, especially in a conservation area, and the objectors to this application believe that Winchester deserves better. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Any questions or clarification for Ms Davidson? No? Thank you very much for coming along today. Um, next, we have um, one of the ward councillors, Councillor Charles Radcliffe. Good afternoon, and uh, you have five minutes when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as a ward councillor for St Michael, I'd like to add my opposition to the proposed expansion uh, of the property located at 10 Compton Road. I've reviewed the planning documents and visited the street, met with a number of local residents and been contacted by several others, all of whom I have to say are united in their dismay at the application before you. I've also had a look at the planning history, which I think we could fairly describe as checkered, marred by past planning violations and involving two retrospective planning applications, including for alterations made when the existing building was converted to a separate two bedroom dwelling. Uh, more recently, approval was given for a substantial ground floor extension, which is currently only half built. And now already permission is sought for a new application uh, for an even, a second, even bigger extension to the front. If you take these two extensions together, they would almost double the footprint and floor area of the original building. Now, the objections that have been submitted to the planning department cite various grounds for refusing the application. I'd like to focus uh, just <laughs> on one ground in particular, and that is design. As you'll know, good design is central to good development. It's a key plank of the Council's own adopted planning policies, including its supplementary planning document on high quality places. It's also defined as a, identified as a key priority in the latest version of the government's central planning policy framework. And in this context, of course, design means more than just aesthetic appeal, which is anyway, to some extent, a subjective judgment, or quality of construction, important though these considerations are. Crucially, it includes whether a proposed building enhances or detracts from the placement, massing and spacing of existing buildings in a given setting. In other words, does it fit in with the context of its environment? Extensions are no exception 
they must comply with specific design principles, in this case set out in the City Council's High Quality Places SPD, which states that extensions are generally most successful when they are subservient to the host dwelling. The SPD goes on to give examples of how this can be achieved, including setting an, setting an extension back from the front elevation setting down the ridge and eaves and making sure that the original appearance of the building remains clearly discernible. But the designs submitted for approval today tend to go in the opposite direction, offering a large front-facing extension that obscures and altogether overwhelms the original building. Now that, that would raise a red flag in any setting, but Compton Road is in a conservation area, which requires us to take extra care to protect the character of the local neighborhood. Compton Road and the surrounding streets contain certainly a mix of housing styles, but one of the key characteristics that contribute to the area's charm is the presence of several large Edwardian and Victorian villas, each surrounded by gardens and with outbuildings that are well set back from the road. Number 10, Compton Road started life as just such an outbuilding. It was a small coach house for the much larger adjacent house now known as 12 Compton Road. Repurposing these kind of outbuildings, giving them a new lease of life as attractive homes is a very positive objective that I hope we would all support. But supersizing them, transforming them into large sprawling houses in their own right, compromises the existing pattern of development and threatens the character of the streets that we're trying to preserve. And that is the risk I think that we run if this development is approved. If we approve it, it won't be the last. There are multiple other outbuildings in nearby streets that might be also turned into large £2 million houses by a developer with an eye to an opportunity. To be clear, as a city, we, we need more housing, especially affordable, low carbon housing for young people, families and others priced out of our community. But this proposal contributes nothing to that goal. Approving it risks opening the floodgates for similar schemes and bit by bit, plot by plot, we will lose precisely the thing that makes these streets so special. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, members of the committee, any questions for um, Councillor Radcliffe? No, so thank you very much, Councillor Radcliffe, for coming along this afternoon. Now, I have two um, supporters down here, Alison Jowett. Yeah, Chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see if you were looking. And Mr. Hamlin? He's not here today. Okay, just you. Yeah. Okay. So when you're ready, you have three minutes. <coughs> Madam Chair, councillors, and council officers, thank you for your time today. Oh, sorry. I'm especially grateful for the expert opinion of the historic environment officer and the planning officers who have considered the pre-application and full planning application and found that this proposal meets all heritage and planning requirements. Number 10 is a unique site on Compton Road with a vastly different set of characteristics and arrangement to all other dwellings in the immediate vicinity. This is a householder application for our home, which has been in our ownership for 14 years. When purchased in 2007, the dwelling was dilapidated. As a consequence of this condition, we carried out a full heritage refurbishment, which saved it. It is not unreasonable to expect that after 14 years, family requirements have changed and that our home now requires modifications to meet those needs. Contrary to the assertion that our proposal does damage to the conservation area, the historic environment team have stated that the proposed design adds depth and context to the current arrangement of building. Our current building is old and in a conservation area, but it is not a designated heritage asset. Two historic environment officers have commented that our building has no historic merit. Not all structures in a conservation area have historic value. The value in our property is found in being able to repurpose it for a viable family home, enabling multi-generational living. The proposed structure is a modest extension to a modest building and represents an adaptive reuse of a building which no longer serves its original purpose as a coach house and stables. Adaptive reuse is a form of historic preservation and the proposed extension will extend the building's life and usefulness by making it relevant to modern living and future generations. The proposal does not constitute overdevelopment. The site coverage with the proposed works would amount to 40.5% of the overall plot 
and is located on existing hard landscaping, thus protecting and preserving the existing green space. This green space has been extensively nurtured and developed during our ownership. In order to preserve the integrity of the original building, the proposal is not built on the existing footprint, but is a proposed link structure, and this will demonstrate an historic timeline and will illustrate how the use of a building changes with the different needs of different generations. The solar studies show that there is no overbearing, overshadowing, overlooking, loss of daylight or sunlight to neighbouring immunity space. In fact, the proposed structure at 1.5 storeys is subservient to its own main two-storey building and sits comfortably under the eaves of the three-storey properties surrounding it. The design mirrors and complements the original structure and demonstrates strong architectural links to both near and immediate neighbours and the immediate conservation area. In line with the recommendation of both historic and planning officers, I respectfully request that you approve this application. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, questions for Mr. Jarrett? Yeah, Mr. Jarrett, when I um, came out in the week to see the property in front, I couldn't see your property um, because the gates are sort of quite high and there's a lot of vegetation as well. So is all that vegetation staying? Yeah, there's one raised bed which has wisteria in it that will be removed, but that wisteria will be reused to mask at the front of the property. So from the street scene you won't see this? Um, I think it's very unlikely it will be screened quite well. I mean the original, as you know, the original building is very just glimpsed from the street. Thank you. Any further questions? No. So thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Um, Cameron, anything you want to add? I have nothing further, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll move then to our reports and we'll look at the principle of development and design and layout on page 208. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it really is just to clarify the relevant planning history. The two applications that are mentioned but i thought or i understood from the ward councillor there were others which are not on the list can, can, Karen, can you inform us on that so we did see in one of the slides some work going on that's a previous permission yeah, that's from 2019 which is for a single story flat roof extension which has been permitted that's the um, the top one under relevant planning history. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. But are there any others, Councillor Ray? What's the name? So there was the one which was withdrawn previously, and top and head, unfortunately, I can't remember any uh, others, unfortunately, which come to mind. It's just that I seem to interpret uh, the Lord Councillor as thinking there's another one, and no. he's nodding in a way. So if you're listening to the recording, um, Mrs. Pinnock is just checking the past history of planning applications. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Chair. There seem to be, um, the planning history shows that there were five uh, previous cases. I'm just going to have to get my... There was a lawful development certificate um, in 2018, which was used for the property as a single private dwelling house. Uh, there was an application in 2019, which is the one that's on your list. And the only other one, Chair, that's coming up was in the 2017 one, so that is the, the list of that. Yeah. So I, I think the Lawful Development Certificate, what's interesting, probably isn't relevant to this household application, 
So I think the key ones are listed there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Was there... You mentioned farm, but I didn't mention farm. Chair, I didn't read out that there was a pre app. And there was pre app advice on this application as well. Um, any other questions on um, principle of development and design and layout? You wish to speak, Jane? If I may, just for clarification, I think there was a 27 scheme which was withdrawn. Um, but the certificates of lawful development fell out of that to establish the lawful residential use of uh, the existing building. So that's where that came from. Interestingly, the 2017 scheme, although it was withdrawn, it was also supported in heritage terms, and that was for a, a front extension as well, not dissimilar from the scheme in question, uh, which was didn't receive an objection in heritage terms either. Right. The members of the committee, um, I can't remember your surname, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Um, Jenny Malik Thor, it's a funny one. <laughs> he's, he's one of the new conservation officers. Um, did you want to make any more comments on the, the conservation aspect? Yeah. Um, I can only, I suppose, usefully re reiterate what I've said previously at, at, at RIA, but um, as part of the um, current application, I guess, um, in re response or perhaps rebuttal to um, some other, other things that have been said this afternoon, the existing building was an ancillary, we call it a coach house, I'm not sure what we have to substantiate that, but it was an ancillary building to uh, number 12 Compton Road historically, that relationship has now been completely severed both functionally and legibly within the street scene um, and the existing building itself has also been so altered um, and its integrity so diminished um, and so sanitised that again that historic functional relationship with the neighbouring building is all but lost and as you've pointed out you can barely see it from the street scene, so any kind of visual relationship or appreciation of that historic functional relationship is, is minimal uh, to nil. Um, whilst some people have observed that the disposition of the development within the site isn't completely cohesive, I think uh, we can recognise that that's a product of its the design response to the local constraints and some of the neighbours. Uh, concerns and uh, that wouldn't, it's important to note that that wouldn't ultimately result in a form of development that's actually harmful to the character and appearance of this conservation area. Uh, meanwhile, the, the scale of the building is in keeping with the one behind it without actually disturbing um, any of the fabric of that building, um, so it would be entirely reversible. Um, the style of the style of the, the new extension um, has very little to respond to in terms of the existing building. As I say, it's been so sanitised, and that I can understand. I think that's why it's taken that classically inspired route um, to respond, although not to not to ape or to um, replicate uh, the, the, the neighbouring buildings, but to complement them in a contextual way. Um, I think we have to recognise that in this part of the conservation area, there's quite an eclectic and iterative accumulation of different forms of development, although there's a prevailing um, sort of classical influence there. And this would be just one further iteration in that evolved um, street, streetscape. Um, so this, this is my thought process in concluding that the proposals would preserve, i.e. not harm, what's characterful, what's significant about this part of the conservation area, but also uh, the conservation area as a whole. Um, it's worth keeping in mind Winchester conservation area as a whole um, is what we're talking about here. So that's me. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, that's very useful. Um, and this is quite a substantial plot, isn't it? It goes back a long way. 
It does, yeah. It's very long and thin. Uh, the existing building is very far set back from the building line. Um, even with the new development, that would be the case. And whilst it is set, would be set forward of number 12, it would be set back from number 8. And in that way, I think it quite successfully make, would make a transition, like a graded transition from back to front in terms of that streetscape. Um, I think, and again, I think that's a neutral impact. I don't think it's a bad thing that one building is slightly forward than another necessarily. And it's important to note also that even if you could glimpse it from the street scene, visibility doesn't equate to harm, which is just important to keep in mind. So we've heard all about harm this afternoon. Not from you. <laughs> um, thank you. So shall we look at the um, two impacts, um, impact on the character of the area and impact on the surrounding residential community? Any questions there? If not, then we'll move to anything else on the report, which is in fact just by way of parking and equality and the conditions and informative. So we'll move into debate. So I'm, I'm, I'll speak then. Um, I mean, I have been out and what I could see in the plot, I didn't actually enter the site. And um, as confirmed with the applicant, I really don't think you're going to see this. Um, I have heard what and the varying views are on the conservation including our own officer, um, but I, I, don't, I can't see the substantial harm um, here um, of, of this, these works. And, um, we have the sort of odd case of two properties at the back of their plots and then two properties and the rest of them all coming forward and this is just sort of linking between the two of them. So, I, I really can't see any material planning reason to refuse this, personally. Any other contribution? So we move to the vote. Um, this uh, application has been recommended for approval, um, subject to the conditions on page 210 and the and 211 and the informatives on 211, 212. All those in favour of approving this application is shown. That's all eight members, Chair. So that application is approved. Thank you very much. We now need um, a five minute gap so that we can re sanitize the um, tables and then the next members of the project. Most, most circle boys are going to turn up for the new visa. 
No, I'm looking forward to going around there for free. I've tried to pass the lot of the Catholic Yeah, I know. It's, we had um, a group, <coughs> group of uh, Catholic British folk. You were fine sitting down, no problem. Very sure. Nice bikes. Uh, one man took off. One man came in the right to the And the other took off. I don't think any of them had the right to stop. I mean, that was from a standing start, yes. And it had been a part of the world. And I had that fifth time about this application on a bicycle. They don't do them so much in the world. They fit the whole job, absolutely. And they can pay the spinner as you. They're the Yes.
which is 21 stroke 01349 stroke HOU. This is the erection of a new garden room stroke uh, storage shed and the update sheet does actually state um, home office been added at 11 Ashburton Place, 15 Gibraltar Avenue, Winchester. Um, I noticed Chairman the update should change the definition of that. Yes, yes, to, and has added, well, if you, the reason, because are we missing, oh, you've you absented yourself. Have you checked that it's okay to stay in the room? Yes, um, Councillor West has just declared a predetermination rather than a, an interest, so he's able to sit in the room. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, so the reason that's been changed, Councillor um, Pearson, is that it does, one of the um, conditions says no business use, and we thought that was too restrictive, because, you know, you might want to have a home office there, um, so we didn't want a business run from there, so we've added Home Office to make that clear. So the case officer is Marge Ballinger. Um, when you're ready, Marge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this slide, I wanted to show the, the site property. Um, it's a fairly new development located on the west side of Chilbolton Avenue, and the land west is to the golf course. And the proposal site that I'm referring to is outlined in red. And I wanted to note that the rear garden steps up and away from the development. And the location of the outbuilding is within the corner of the site where it's indicated on the location plan. The trees along the south boundary are protected. And other, I'll show you on the next slide, the, the location of the communal garden. So this is a further detailed site plan. Again, the dwelling here has a paved patio area to, to adjacent to the dwelling behind the house. Then there's a set of stairs where there's a raised rear garden area. Originally, there was a paved hard standing here in the corner where the location of the outbuilding has been placed. The land indicated here in green, west and south, is communal garden space to the other residents of Ashburton. These are the plans and elevations. It is a flat roof structure, uh, the, the front facing east, actually, north, it's right in front of me here. It has glazed doors and windows, side panels. The south elevation has high level windows and other entrance into the storage area. The east side elevation will face the rear garden to number 11. And this side west elevation has a set of windows. And the floor plan indicates how there is a separate storage area designated to the building. Photo one here shows the rear elevation with 11, number 11 in, in the main focus with the other terrace dwellings behind. There's approximately, um, this is, shows def, approximately half of the entire development. And this photo was taken from the raised garden of number 11. Photo two is the outbuilding as viewed from the communal garden space, which is adjacent the upper garden of number 11. The building is sited near a retreating wall, which is also adjacent to a communal pathway. This is how the residents obtain access into the communal rear garden. And photo three is the outbuilding viewed from the lower garden space to number 11.
photos four and five are views of the outbuilding from the communal spaces. Photo five is from um, the approach of the pathway. And photo four oh, is also, they're both from the, the pathway. These photos demonstrate the wider views of the, the golf course beyond. Photo six is a view from the communal garden space back toward the rear elevation of number 11 and its um, outdoor space. Photo seven is a view also from the communal garden space showing the relationship of the wall to the outbuilding. And photo eight is taken from another point of view of the communal garden space back toward the, the boundary of the trees. So the, the outbuilding is just out of shot, but just to, to give you a perspective of the size of the communal garden space. And some of the neighbors have kindly provided some photos from inside their dwellings as well as from terraces. I've only provided a few, but I, I do have additional photos if required. Photo nine is a view from inside the dining space of flat 11, which is behind number 11. Flat seven, excuse me, flat seven behind the dwelling of number 11. <coughs> Photo 10 is a view from the terrace of flat seven. And photo 11 is a view from flat eight and the outdoor terrace there. Photo 12 is um, a view from inside flat eight through a window. Photos 13 and 15 were taken from the adjacent property at the Royal Winchester Mews, as there were some comments made about the relationship of the building to these dwellings as well. And this is to indicate that in front of the dwellings are, is a drive, then a high hedge row, and behind that are some outbuildings and then a fence. So this is to show the relationship of the building if, if one is to go behind the outbuilding and the hedge. And this is a final photo showing the development from a longer distance with the outbuilding here on the right into the upper raised garden. Beyond this is the communal space, garden space to the residents. And of course, I'm standing approximately in the land beyond, assuming it would be the garden, near the golf course. The proposal is outside the public realm and does not have a significant or detrimental impact on the residential amenities of the occupants of the adjacent properties. And it's not considered visually intrusive to the wider views the proposal is considered to be in compliance with the policies of the de development plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to the public speaking. Um, and we have an objector, first of all, Dr. Charles Knightley. Good afternoon, Dr. Knightley. And so when you're ready, you have three minutes and you can see the, the test clock that's counting down and we'll restart it once you start speaking. It's in the left hand corner of the screen. And when you get to three minutes, so you need to sort of give me your last statement or I'll have to stop you. Um, so when you're ready, Dr. Knightley. Okay. Um, could you put your microphone on? It is a button at the base of the, the sort of stick. Lovely. Is that right? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. I'll try and keep it short. And first of all, I'd like to start by saying that just about every resident of Ashburton Place has objected to this shed. And basically because it is overbearing and domineering in what is already an overdeveloped area. I mean, the photographs don't actually do it justice. I mean, if you actually see it in real life, stand in somebody's area, you can actually see how big it is. I mean, it does interfere with the communal grounds, I mean, which are used by the residents. I mean, there's a loss of privacy because their windows um, from the shed look straight onto the communal area, 
rather than anywhere else. And I think the design, appearance and materials used are completely out of character. I mean, compared to the Ashburton building itself. I mean, it is built on elevated ground, which makes it stand out. I mean, it could have been chosen to be on a less elevated ground and wouldn't have been so prominent. I mean, we know that permitted rights were removed and we were told it was in the interest of the area and the layout of the development. Well, this is completely contrary to that. Um, I know plans have to look at rules and regulations, but there are humans involved. And clearly this has a negative impact on the well-being of all of our residents there. So from those points of views, I'd like to say I object to the planning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There might be some questions of clarification from the committee. Councillor Pearson. Just the one, Dr. Knight, if I may. The location of this, is this owned by the applicant or is it part of the communal land? It is owned by the applicant. Right. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? No, so thank you very much for coming along. And um, the other public speaker, um, we have a statement from the agent, did David need and he's, Simon Carter is going to read that statement. That's you, Mr. Carter, or? That is me. It's, yes, it's or you, are you it's Mr. Mead? my statement, in actual fact. David, David was going to speak, but this time yesterday I thought he was going to speak, but he can't, so it's actually my statement. Oh, it's your statement. Yes, that's fine. It is. Okay, so um, do you want a rerun of the clock, or have you seen No, 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 you, you can start the yeah. clock and I start speaking okay. and I'll, I should finish about 20 seconds to spare if all goes <laughs> to plan. Right. Okay. So when you're ready, okay. you've got three minutes. Well the, well, the first thing I want to do is actually apologise for the fact that our planning application is a retrospective one. Um, this is not as we would have wanted it to be. We made a genuine error for which we are sincerely sorry. We would have much rather followed the normal process and submitted an application in advance and thus avoided the need for all the anguish a retrospective planning application necessarily entails, both for ourselves, but also for our neighbours, not, not least, of course, the Knightleys, who I, I know have really suffered quite a lot of anguish as a result of all of this. So I'm sorry. We are, however, grateful to our immediate neighbours at number 12 for their positive approach to the room and indeed their wholesome support for it. Other neighbours commented extensively about the proximity of the garden room to the community garden. We've been careful to ensure that the room conforms with all regulations in terms of location and size and proximity. Our neighbours are rightly concerned about privacy, but so are we. Privacy is, after all, a two-way street, and we're just as concerned to ensure our privacy is maintained as we are to respect the privacy of our neighbours. Our hedge already provides a significant level of screening between the garden room, it is a garden room by the way, it's not a shed, and the communal garden space. And in a little more time, it will obscure the view of the communal garden completely. Indeed, it's already 18 inches higher than when the garden room was erected. This time next year, I don't think you'll be able to see the garden room or the communal ground, depending on which way you stand. Of course, the garden room is sited on top of the original patio that the developers created, and our neighbours would have been aware of this if or when they viewed the promotional video that Alfred Holmes produced. I asked will ask, what difference does it make in terms of our visibility of anyone enjoying the communal garden if we sit in our new garden room as opposed to the original patio area? Indeed, our house was built with a balcony not 50 feet away from the communal garden and with an elevated position providing a full and unobstructed view of any neighbour who might be there. Accordingly, we just struggle to understand that argument. The room, just to be very clear about this, will be used as a garden room. We can sit and admire our garden from it. Since the pandemic, I have been working from home for the most part, as so many people have. My wife uses her study, 96 square feet, but that's not big enough for two people, and I, I need to be able to hold private and confidential telephone conversations from time to time. The garden room has two armchairs. I typically sit in one of these and work from my laptop or mobile phone 
There's no desk or other office equipment. I simply wish to be able to quietly enjoy my property without interference with or from anyone else. And the garden room facilitates this. The case officer's report confirms there are no planning reasons why permission should be declined to call the garden room, and I hope you will agree. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and questions from the committee? Could I start? Um, whose was the choice of colour? Uh, it was our choice of colour, um, but we took some advice and it was suggested that if you go darker, it's, it's less in your face, less obstructive than a white or a, a kind of timber frame building, but grey is the dominant colour of Ashburton Place. If you go to Ashburton Place, the whole development, when it comes to any kind of painted surface, is grey of one hue or another. Um, I think you said that this time next year you wouldn't see it. Yeah, the, there's, a, there's a Portuguese um, laurel hedge. Um, when the photographs were taken by your planning officer, the hedge was pretty well level with the, the, the window sill. They're now 18 inches high. It's about halfway up the window because it grows at about 18 to 24 inches a year. So I think by this time next year, the hedge will have grown to a point where we won't be able to see anybody in the communal garden and they won't be able to see us. Um, the windows are there really for light. The, the, the main vista is the other way, is looking out uh, to the over the golf course uh, where you've got the long, large windows. And we're going to have blinds installed if we get permission to keep the, um, the room. So we'll have blinds installed on all the windows. Um, when you're sitting down, I can't see over the hedge anyway, even, even in its present form. Thank you. Final question for me. Um, you heard your apology for it being retrospective. Yeah. You didn't hear the reason why it's retrospective. Well, naively, the last time I bought or sold a house and moved was 1997. And I honestly knew nothing about permitted rights and them being withdrawn or anything like that. I just thought I bought a freehold property and that providing I worked within the regulations, which I've obviously done, then there was no need for planning permission. I stand corrected on that, and it would have been so much easier if we'd just known that at the time, if our solicitor had made that clear to us. Um, the solicitor had written on our behalf to ask permission of the developer for the room to be built, because that was one of the covenants. Um, so they knew all about it, but they never thought to say to us when they did the searches, oh, by the way, permitted rights withdrawn which means you're going to have to go and get planning permission, even though it wouldn't ordinarily require it. If only they said that, I, I would have been putting in a planning application through the normal process. I'm sorry. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Thank you very much indeed. You're very well. Today. Um, so we move to um, principles development, page 240, 241 and um, design and layout. No, so we move on then to impact on the character of the area and in fact to the end of the report because there's only one more page of no. So debate. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate uh, that you may have gotten the planning permission, but the matter is before us whether we uh, agree with the planning statement that this is uh, allowable as a planning application. And I feel that this is rather obstructive um, and it's viewed from very many places and I cannot support this uh, application. Thank you. Any other comments? I too can't support this. I know it is just a small structure, but um, the point of the removing permitted development rights from Ashburton Place was to have two symmetric type buildings. And now we've got in the corner of one of the gardens 
what I consider to be quite an intrusive um, structure. And it is very visible, when we look at the photos, it's very visible from all round. And we heard from Dr Knightley that every resident, except perhaps one, because um, Mr Carter says that one of his neighbours was supported, have objected. And you can see it from everywhere. It, it is raised. And the difference between sitting as a family on a patio and then having a sort of large structure on there is that that's in your face the whole time. The people who are sitting on the patio go away. They don't sit there all the time. And if I lived there, I wouldn't want to look out at that. And I think this actually goes against the um, removal of permitted development rights. And I can see people um, are against it because of loss of privacy. And I think it sets up a precedent. Um, so uh, I don't think it's a very good colour. I know that might be the dominant colour. Um, but I, I just don't, I just find it intrusive and it would have been better um, if consultation had taken place, there might be a better place for it, but every everyone can see it, so I can't support it either. Any further comment? So this has been recommended for approval. All those in favour of approving um, this application, please show. Three members, Chair. And those against? Five members against. Five? Five. Mm. There's only eight members, Chair. And now um, we're going to have to come up with reasons for um, refusing the application. Well, I gave no reason for that. Chairman, I do think I need a little bit more, I'm afraid. Uh, looking at DN16 uh, in Local Plan Part 2, uh, the policy talks about developments which are called that the development will be permitted, provided they, uh, and the, the first line is response positively to the character, appearance, and variety of the local environment within and surrounding the site in terms of its design, scale, and layout. I think perhaps what you're saying is you don't believe it responds positively to the character, appearance of the environment, and that, that would be the substantive reason for your refusal, um, unless members tell me sort of anything further than that. But that's, um, so that's a Roman numeral one. There are a, a bullet of seven um, points, but I think that would be the key reason for refusal, Chairman, in my view. I, I don't necessarily, and I haven't heard this from anyone, think we think it affects neighbour amenity. It's more about its scale and impact. Yeah. And that is colour, the height. Um, yeah. It's, it's just, it's, I don't think we can necessarily say design, it's just its built form, isn't it? It's, it's scale um, and impact. So, anyone want to add to that? Just to add, it, it may be a similar point, but under impact on character of the area and, and neighbourhood. Um, there are a large number of individual flats within this development, uh, all of which are affected. Uh, and the building has a very strong structural form. And I would have thought that the, the neighbours would have appreciated its integrity and its simplicity, which this addition uh, deteriorates. I expect that's probably getting wrapped yeah. up in that reason, Chair, because yeah. we've got to go to the heart of the planning policy yeah. to find that reason for refusal. And I think that would be where I would suggest that the DM16 would be your overriding uh, reason, Chair. Okay. So. Sorry, Chair, I'm just checking mm. the case. Mm. Our experience, these policies are appeal. Just put the right ones. Okay, so are we done? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that um, application has been refused.
Yeah, you do have to vote all the solicitors. You do have to vote, vote all, all those um, who are supporting the refusal of this application. Please show. Five, Chair. And those against? Three against. Thank you. Right, so we move then on to the last application of the day. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming along. the last session of the Planning Development Control uh, Committee here at Winchester City Council We're on item 14 and we are about to address the um, application at Lumi's um, who are looking for permission for a workshop and storage space on the site and the workshop will be for inside four containers um, the number of the application is SN, SDNP, it's in the South Downs National Park, uh, stroke 21, stroke 01687, stroke FUL. The case officer is Hannah Harrison, who's here with us, and when you're ready, Hannah, off you go. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, today I present to you an application for loonies on Lord Holton Road, West Neon. Uh, the application seeks plan permission for a workshop and storage space within the site. The workshop will be contained within four containers. <coughs> Here is the location plan. We'll now go through the site photos. Uh, photos have been taken throughout the year. Um, each photo will have a little indentation on the corner, just to let you know when I took them. And there's a small map in the corner to let you know where the site is and where I am when I've taken the photograph. So this is the entrance to Loomis. This is across the road, across the A32, <coughs> indicating here that the proposed site is just set behind the cafe. Photos taken within the car park. Again, within the car park, but a bit closer to the proposed location. This is the existing Lumi shop that was granted permission. Photos taken within the proposed location of the store. Photos taken within the proposed location again, but looking out for far views. <coughs> Photos taken on the 272 looking into the proposed location. Uh, you can see very faint views of the existing Lumi shop. Photo taken from the neighbouring property within their driveway. Now onto the plans. This is the existing site plan. Proposed site plan. Proposed plans of the elevations of the workshop and store. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, that takes us to public speaking. Um, now we have three objectors speaking, and I think it's been explained to you that you only have three minutes to share between you, or you have you nominated a spokesperson to take on all three minutes? There's only, there's only two present today. Okay, so who have we got present? And um, so we're going, share, we're going to share the three minutes. We're going to share, but who have you got present? Uh, sorry, that's me, Steve Dale, and Sam Plum. Okay. Okay, not Rebecca Corbett. No. <laughs> right. And you're going to share the three minutes, and you've decided who's going first. Um, so, I think that's going to be me. And if you look now at the screen, there's a sample of a clock counting down. And so when you start speaking, we'll reset the clock to three, three minutes. And then, um, Sam, if you want to speak, then you need to keep an eye on the I'll clock. Speak, I'll speak. OK, yeah. So when you're ready, um, Mr. Gale, you have three minutes. And yes, you've got your microphone on. Yeah. We object to this application, and we refer to some current planning policies, and specifically SD7 of the South Downs National Park, entitled Relative Tranquility, with its purpose to conserve and enhance tranquility. Lumi's is a great focal point for the biking community, but the excessive noise of the bikes is a huge ongoing problem. Despite the owner's engagement with customers and enforcement agencies, it's got worse over the years. Excessive motorbike noise in this area perfectly correlates with the business activities at the Lumi's Cafe, and 24 Acoustics, an acoustical consultant, has collected data. That
and demonstrates this, we can share the details. More full of movies equals more motorbikes and dramatically more noise. The packs of bikes on Wednesdays and weekends causes an increase in noise. I understand that these facts could be overlooked without local knowledge, so I draw your attention to it now. Noise is our single biggest concern, but noise control does not seem to be part of this planning assessment. Surprisingly, no noise impact assessment has been carried out, despite the request by objectors, including the local MP, Rick Drummond. And the predicted increase in motorbike noise has been disregarded, but it's the main concern for people living nearby. The comments of the environmental health consultant also seem to have been ignored without his proposed conditions being applied. The planning assessment states, the installation and use of storage containers will not be increasing any noise or introduce any additional traffic into the local area. This assessment is inaccurate, but we can correct it now. Passive storage is not the subject of the application. It's for a workshop. In fact, the application bears the title Boomi's Workshop and is submitted under the new wider class E use category. The application states, the proposed Louis workshop would also be used as a space for the storage of site equipment and as a general workshop to serve the site. This opens up the vast array of previously proscribed activity. Excessive noise is completely incompatible with the purpose of the South Downs National Park, but the formal policy instruments to protect the environment from this disruption have not been obviously employed in this instance, sadly. So the South Downs National Park have a mandate to stop things getting worse, and we simply ask them to act accordingly. As residents, we cannot tolerate a development that simply increases the noise producing activity rather than reducing it. We therefore request that this planning application is rejected based on failing to meet the objectives of the following. Please also remember at this point, the national policy framework states the national parks have the highest level of protection. Um, so we identify policies 12, 15 and 9, which have been failed. And these include um, develop paragraph 134, paragraph 174E and number 15, paragraph 176 and number 15, paragraph 185 and number 15, paragraph 113 and number 9, paragraph 111 and number 9. I would expand more, but I've run out of time. But it, it's a considerable number of policies that it fails on. Would you like me to speak from here or, or go over Wherever there? I feel like I'm, I'm talking to Council Edward's back, so I don't know whether he, he minds that or not. You want to move to the or you'll you're naked, or I'll have, have a claim. I'll move over there, that's probably okay. easy. So you should. It's the When you're ready, thank you. When you're ready, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this afternoon. I know you've had a long day, so um, and we are the last one, so we are between you and the end. Um, however, it is good to be back in person. Um, I have to say, having read the application and the report uh, on it, I'm afraid that's where my good feelings end. Many members of the committee will have heard or read my views before on the subject of antisocial motorbikes. They're speeding along our roads and country lanes, often with modified exhaust pipes, is a blight on the lives of many. They destroy the, the tranquility of this part of South Downs National Park. And Messrs Gale and Plum have given more detail on its impact. I don't want to repeat what they said. But Chair, the problem they describe is all too real, and this report ignoring of this is a real concern. I'm not sure if the officers involved have ever visited Loomis on a Wednesday evening or a Sunday, or indeed heard the level of noise generated by modified exhaust pipes and how far away you can hear them. It is, I have to tell you, an horrendous sight and an horrendous sound. Last Wednesday, for example, it wasn't possible to see the tarmac in the car park for motorbikes. They'd also filled up the lane by opposite, which we saw on the photographs that, that Hannah put up. This report suggests the expansion is needed for the business to survive. 
How bad will it get around my faith with the additional support? And given it's that full already, if it's not viable now, I don't think it ever will be. And if you think the complaints are only limited to a few local moaning minis like Messrs Gale, Plum and myself, consider that there were 94 objections to this application. I counted those yesterday, not 84 as said in the report. Pretty much all from people within the National Park, including the local parish council, as well as adjoining parishes such as East Tisted and East Meal. This emphasises the strength of the feeling there is, and I do find it astonishing this has been brushed over by the report. Indeed, one of the objectors was actually me as a ward councillor, and that is not even referred to in the report. I know there were people writing in to support the application. Has any analysis been done on where those supporters came from? I had a look yesterday and took a sample by simply looking at the first five in chronological order. They were from Ferrum, Poole, which is in Dorset, Crawley, now that's the one near Gatwick, not the one near Winchester, Whiteley, which Councillor Ben and I know is a wonderful place, and Tadworth, which is near Reigate, has a KT um, postcode. These are not locals, these are people coming from far and wide and so this is not an effective counterweight. It is in fact evidence as to why we do want to, we do not want to add further tea traps on this site by allowing its expansion. Given the Pacific SDM, SDNPA policies on tranquility and the fact that so many parishes are rejected on the basis of noise and traffic, I do question, as the previous speakers, why no formal environmental assessment has been carried out or acoustic analysis done. I think that is sufficient for the recommendation to be overturned. The report also refers to SD4 and SD5 of the SDNP local plan. It says that the purpose of these policies is to ensure that all development is of the highest possible design quality, which reflects and respects the exceptional quality of the natural, agricultural and built environment of the National Park. Proposals should adopt a landscape-led design approach. And what do we have here? Four containers. Yes, they may at first be shielded a bit and have some sort of covering, but it's pretty weak. Look at the images on page 283, or the last slide that Anna put up. They are fundamentally a bunch of containers. And who is to say that these flimsy protections offered will remain and be maintained? Let's put this another way. If someone installed four containers opposite your house, would you feel that this reflected the highest possible design quality, or would you be frankly livid? This is simply not good enough for the National Park, and I suggest it should be rejected as such. And yes, I see there is dancing around about specific uses, but the fact is this. Once these containers are in, the principle is established, the landscape is blighted, and there is nothing to stop them coming back for a change of use. Furthermore, the personalisation to Lumi's Cafe and Lumi's Shop means it can be used for anything on that site with that name, whatever the use. Chair, I'm sorry you crossed today, and particularly at the end of the day, but the recommendation of supporting a piece of landscape vandalism that will attract ever greater crowds to Lumi's and further blight the lives of locals who have been ignored in this report, I do think it's regrettable, and I therefore do urge the committee to reject this application. Many thanks. Thank you, well timed. Um, and um, are there any questions for Councillor Lundy? Councillor Ruffo. Thank you, Chair. Um, Lumi's Caravan, is that residential in your um, idea? You know? uh, that's a separate application. No, it's on this piece of paper. But it's not part of this application. No, I'm asking you a question. Okay. Is it residential? I do not, um, I believe it does not have consent for residential use. Thank you. Any other questions for Councillor Lumley? No. Any concern, no. Councillor If you want to stay there, that's fine. Okay. Rather than move on, we'll stop again. Um, right, so let's, um, members, look at principle of development um, on page 265 and um, design and scale um, and impact on the character of the area. <laughs> Councillor Lenny, then Councillor Okay. Um, the main problems we seem to be having coming through at the moment is the noise from uh, visiting vehicles. Is that a planning consideration? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I can't stress enough that the whole point of this application is for storage. It's not to encourage anybody to live local area. It's not going to encourage any more traffic. It's not going to encourage any more foot flow. It's simply just to throw a load of stock in, a big lawnmower and anything else needed to kind of maintain the site. Um, I, subject to obviously Councillor Lumby's lovely objection speech, I have actually witnessed Lumi's on a Wednesday. I've also witnessed it on a very quiet day and I've also witnessed it in the middle of lockdown. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is, there will always be traffic and there will always be motorbikes there. It doesn't matter if Lumi's is there or not. If this was a, a building other than a container, would we be considering putting in uh, some form of noise abatement in order to muffle noise emanating from the workshop? For example, for repairing a bike, you might want to rev it up to make sure the engine is working properly. Yes, and this is for containers. Yes, I know the two containers. What I'm saying is, is two containers by themselves don't have any soundproofing. Now, if it's a regular, if it was a regular business building, we would expect some soundproofing in order to stop sound coming from that workshop. Most of what we heard is actually about the bikes, but that's not what this application's about. I agree with what was said by the bikers. I mean, crumbs. Anyone who lives close within three miles of the A32 says the same thing about the bikers. Um, so, it, so, is there any form of noise muffling, noise abatement linked with these co new containers that are going in onto this site? Thank you, Chair. Um, kind of repeating what I've just said, there's no form of mechanical works happening within these containers. It's solely just to store stuff based for Loomis Cap and the Loomis Shop. If anybody wants to fix their bike on that site, that's absolutely on their own accord, it's got absolutely nothing to do with Lumi's cafe or shop. If somebody breaks down there, that's completely down to them, it's got nothing to do with Lumi's. The sole purpose of these containers is for storage. There shouldn't be any mechanical works going on within the storage containers. Right. There is, I believe, condition seven, which which states that it is solely used for storage and ancillary purposes. It's got nothing to do with mechanical no, I, I missed that, Sarah. sorry. No, that's fine. So, no, so I want to clarify, a workshop and a storage is quite, two quite different things, as, as you are okay, probably more aware than I am. Um, but equally, I'm more aware of the noise these bikes are making. And it's the A32, by the way, it's not uh, the Alton Road, it's the A32. There is a shop there already. I know there is a shop there already, but that's, uh, I mean, that makes it very difficult to find a planning operation. Yeah. Well, I'll hear what the others say, but I don't further comment. If, if I could just say, obviously, the, the term workshop has been used inappropriately for this application, and it is solely just for yeah. storage. So the whole purpose of this is for storage only and the word workshop shouldn't have been used originally, but it was seen at a lot later date and it was too late to change the application details. So this is solely just for storage. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just on this note, um, Hannah, um, do we have a condition that it should be just for storage? Yes, yes Chair, I believe it's condition seven. Yeah. Page 268 of this government. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Councillor Reid. Chair, to some degree, Councillor Pearson's already asked the question with regard to the workshop terminology. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Just a question of clarification on the plans on page 283. We see elevations uh, and then a ground floor, which looks like a single open space. Is this, in fact, a number of containers for storage use dropped next to each other, or is it envisaged that it would be welded open and made into a, a single space? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I do believe it's a case of putting four containers all together and then completely opening up internally to allow, I think because there's quite a large um, lawnmower that they need to use on the site to maintain the area. Um, when I spoke to the agent, um, that's how I know that the whole purpose of this is for storage. Um, but I think more importantly, the plans is just to kind of indicate the overall floor area for you. But I, of course, I don't know the exact extent of knocking through. Well, can I, I tell you what I'm struggling with? Um, this is in the South Downs National Park and comes under the local plan, newly approved local plan. So first of all, on page 265, we're told that the two policies, SP4, SP5, um, ensure that all development is of the highest possible design. Do green containers come under that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose in an ideal world, we'd have something looking absolutely fabulous there for the National Park, probably wood and actually weather, but they are green containers that do camouflage in the setting quite easily. They are used throughout the whole of the National Park. If you look up a few applications, and you'll see that they do blend in quite well. Um, more importantly, the Lumi's area has actually been planted recently, pretty much directly opposite where this is being placed. So over time it will be screened and you really won't see them at all because it's green on green so we made sure at least condition six for the colour sorry condition three under materials to ensure that the colour is is a dark green as stated within the design and access statement Thank you. Thank you for having finished. And then I've got a problem with the way that the set out. So if I look at page 259, I presume the blue um, shapes are the containers. So on page 259 on the location plan, um, to the far left, that original blue square is the Vivi shop that was retrospectively um, submitted last year and approved. Yeah, but that's um, not blue, is it? Or is it? Is it is on that the, is blue. Yeah. On that okay. location plan, yeah. it doesn't specifically show yeah. the, right. the post. But we're not giving permission for that because it's been that's already there. Yes. And so the other one, the other blue ones, are the containers which is, is part or are part of this application. No, so again, the other blue ones on that page, so the one that's at a slight angle, that's the caravan that's currently on site, which is another application we're currently dealing with, which is currently oh, open. Okay. And then the other two blue boxes represent the cafe itself and the small um, shed that's attached. On the so could you just point to me then where the containers are? Because they're not. They're directly above where the Lumi shop is currently, so they'll be placed directly next to I them. see. So it's that sort of pest faint area. Yes. I see. Yeah. Right. And then could I, I'm still with the National Park, and the two statutory purposes are to conserve and enhance the natural beauty, wildlife, and cultural heritage and to promote opportunities for the public understanding and enjoyment of the special qualities of the area. Could you tell me how this application does it either of them? I don't know where to begin, to be honest with you. Um, so it enhances the National Park in the fact that we're maintaining a, a business that's been well established for some time okay. and obviously that by putting the shipping containers within this location, it helps them grow and helps them stay in business. So we with more noise in the local area. Sorry, but bikes I'm sorry, and you've had your say. Miles, make 115. I'm miles. sorry, could you not interrupt? You've had your say and opportunity to speak, and we're now on members' questions. I'm sorry. Anna, carry on. Sorry, um, I've lost my train of thought. You were saying that it, it brings. Um, Yes. Employment opportunity? Um, so not necessarily employment opportunity, but it helps maintain a business that has been there for some time. Obviously, during the lockdown, I can't even tell you how many businesses have had to close. So by giving Lumi's Cafe this opportunity to put in some storage so they can maintain their current business, that's helping the National Park to be known that they have a local cafe. Right. I suppose I could go with this a bit more if um, there was an agreement to put up um, something to do with the National Park 
you know, for the, for the second one, promote opportunities for understanding and enjoyment. So if there was, you know, sort of a poster or something or a notice board telling you about the National Park. <coughs> Mrs. Finnick says I can't put a condition on for that. Chair, I'm not sure that's really reasonable to sort of condition um, what someone advertises internally, but we could suggest an informative, couldn't we, that, um, that promoted that. And I'm sure, um, you know, who was minded to approve this, um, I know that the applicant is, is present, although didn't want to speak today, uh, is hearing what you're saying. And I would have thought, and I appreciate the issues are sensitive with, with the number of bikes that, that use this premises, although obviously that isn't what we're looking at today whether you like those motorbikes or not they are you know those people are trying to enjoy the past purposes in some way so you know maybe there should be some promotion of that internally uh, and the applicant could acknowledge except, that of an informative yeah yeah i think you know i would support an informative except the public don't have access to that area do they <coughs> do the public have access to that area where the storage containers are going to be um, no, because they'll be behind the cafe itself, right. but in front of the cafe, you have multiple benches. And there's a lot of um, kind of signage to obviously indicate that please leave quietly, because it's obviously quite a rural location. Right. Well, well, we'll come to that later. So, um, are we still on the defensible development? I think we are. Any further comments or questions on principle of development. If not, then there's impact on residential amenity and noise and local amenities and highway impact, which we've heard from the objectors. Thank you, Chair. I noticed in the report there is no um, mention of lighting. Now, a structure such as this may well have some form of lighting, um, definitely on the inside, but whether there will be any exterior lighting. Condition 6. Sorry? Oh, my apologies then, because that's on recommendations and conditions. Okay, I was looking for it in the text. But you are our watchdog in that respect, so it's good to ask the question. Any further questions on those issues? And we've already heard from Hannah that the um, agreeing to put storage containers at the back um, will not have any impact on less traffic because the motorbikes will come anyway. So I think we're done on, on those. Um, so we're into debate. Councillor Pearson. Right. <clears throat> In relation to the night, I just got to say something about Baptist. I mean, Loom is big, it's not the first cafe there. There was a little chef there long years before there. And so it's the fact there's a cafe on this site is long established. Loom is just a present version of it. Uh, I must admit, the number of times I've travelled past this, I never realised there actually was a shop behind it, nor did I realise there's a mobile home behind it either. So it is very discreet, and adding two containers to that behind the shop, uh, you wouldn't be able to see it from the road, might be able to see it from the neighbouring house, but certainly not from the road, possibly not even from the car park itself. It's, it's one of these applications that noise is inevitably going to be talked about. But unfortunately, a storage container does not make a noise. It's the bikers, well, not the bikers, the bikes that make the noise, but the bikers ride. And, it, and I understand exactly what the local communities and what Councillor Lundby has said about this. I entirely agree with that. Unfortunately, this application has no relationship, no connection with any noise that may be emanated from the bikes that can't go on and off this site. 
it, because of that, it's, it it again, business grows. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, please, would you not interrupt? Otherwise, I might have to ask you to leave the room, okay. which would be efficient. Whereas I was talking about the noise made by the bikes going off the site, um, that's not linked with the shop or the containers behind. And if these are simply storage containers for material for the cafe and for the shop, I can't see how that would emanate noise from that either. On the other hand, if it became a mechanical workshop, then that's a different situation. But uh, you assured me through the conditions that this is literally for storage and that's condition. Um, in that case, I must admit, I can't honestly see any planning reason for turning it down. The uh, council Reed has mentioned quite rightly security lights, which clearly would be necessary, um, and those are controlled. Uh, frustrating as it is, I, I, I mean, I, when I say this, I've got to apologise to the local community because they want it turned down because of the noise. But this storage container is not going to make the noise. Thank you. Councillor Westmore. My piece to this, thank you, Chair. Um, there is a reason why they require more storage, and that is presumably to generate more business, or service more business. So, I, I do suspect that by providing more storage, it will generate more footfall, therefore more noise through this site. Um, if that is a material planning reason, then I need, just need some guidance on that. Okay. Councillor Pearson's actually said more or less everything else would say. What I will say for members, um, the units are bolted together. Um, there are no internal walls. Two of the units will be just N pieces and the other two will be three quarter units. So when they all butt together, they'll make a large open space. The reason I say that is because we put one up in the Demmead um, Scout headquarters, which was a former library for Havenborough Council. So, um, yeah, I know how it all fits together. Okay. This is a tricky one uh, because, in itself, as Councillor Pearson said, containers don't generate noise. Um, the A32 and 272 have always had bikers on them, and the volume has increased as that's uh, become more and more popular over the last few years. And it is a major problem for the people that live in that area. However, um, we also used to have uh, a couple of car clubs that used to meet at the West Mean Hut as well, which is in that area, um, and they generated noise, but they've gone uh, in the house, I believe. So there is no planning reason that we can do. We have to rely on the police to control the noise levels um, on that road, because that is the statutory obligation of the police. It's not for us. And sorry about that. I really am. Thank you. Any further comment and debate? No. Um, I would like to <clears throat> have an informative, as this sort of be a sort of halfway point for me to accept that it's not against the National Park um, local plan. I don't think it conserves and enhances the natural beauty, but all let that go because the beauty is there. But it, it would be great if we could put an informative in about the National Park in a public area where, um, well, perhaps I'm encouraging the bikers to go up into the National Park, but it would be great just to highlight that. I'm sure the National Park would be happy to provide that. And um, you say that you think it could be an informative? Yes, Chair, I think we could uh, suggest an informative that recommends the applicant uh, liaise with us or the National Park uh, to consider options for promoting the park's purposes, the understanding of the park's purposes, 
I mean, I've been to Midhurst where the National Park is, and they've got that visitor centre, they've got lots of leaflets yeah. and wayfinders. I'm obviously not expecting, practically not expecting that here, um, but there certainly could be some direction couldn't yeah. there to, yeah. to that. Um, you know, we could suggest that for an informative. So would that, if it were to be approved, would that be acceptable to the committee and informative? Yes. Mm -hmm. Look for I've got no. So this application right. has been recommended for approval. All those in favour, please show. Against. Eight members for chair, one against. Thank you very much. So that application is approved. Chairman, I know you've just taken your vote, sorry to jump in. I did just wonder if, if it would be helpful for clarity if we amended the description before we issued the decision to take out the, the phrase workshop. Yeah. Um, because given that we've conditioned it that it should only be used as storage, I, I think that would be reasonable yeah. that we describe it as that in the, the, sure in the that description we would all agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Whilst I agree with that, I thought there was an indication we couldn't. Okay. It's only amending the description of development because it is about how it describes it. The condition prohibits anything other than storage yeah. anyway. So I, I, I thought you said it couldn't be without the advertising. I think Hannah didn't do it, Chair, but I'm, I'm satisfied at this stage yeah. that you know it more adequately describes yeah, I, and that's I reasonable. Thank you, members. A long day. Um, and so the next meeting is, um, I think, September the... Well, that's it.